Welcome to the May 24th, 2022 regular board meeting and work session of Paulding County School District. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. First item on our agenda is to have the invocation and pledge. Mr. Dean will lead us in the invocation and pledge. Let us stand, please. Bow our heads. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity for us to gather here as a team and, and work to help better our school system for our children. Just lead us and guide us today and give us the wisdom and the courage to follow your God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Place the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for Next item on our agenda is to adopt the agenda. May I get a motion? So moved. So moved by Ms. Collette. Second. Second by Mr. Fuller. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. So moved. Uh, do we have any public participation? Yeah. All right. So we will uh, now move into our organizational excellence where the rest of you guys will be enjoying the next three hours hanging out with us. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Barnett, and uh, we'll get off started. we go. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we do have the GSBA Dream Team in the house uh, this morning. So uh, today is our whole board governance training. So our agenda has been designed uh, and organized around the state board's standards for effective boards. So there are eight domains in the standards. Excuse me. Yes, sir. I believe we have to approve our minute. I, I think you're Did right. I miss it? I, did miss we it. We did only do one thing. I, I did. I, pro I apologize. I went right past it and checked it even. <laughs> no, no, no. Th th thank you, John. Thing. I'm glad you did. Uh, uh, may I get a motion to approve the regular session minutes from May 10, 2022? So moved by Ms. Lyons, second by Mr. Clayton. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. Now, yep. we can move along. <laughs> yeah, so picking back up on that, we have eight domains in the standards. Um, and so we've uh, provided hard copies for the board of those uh, domains. Also, uh, the board norms and protocols, you'll have a hard copy again at your seat. Of course, all that is on your board dashboard as well. But we're going to start with domain two. We're going to take them a little out of order, strategic planning. That's our session one. And so Dr. Jason Gregatis, our chief of staff, along with GSBA's Lenita Jackson and Steve Barker, will lead us up to this morning's request for board approval of the strategic plan framework, uh, performance objectives and strategy map. Just to give you a little bit of a heads up in session two, Tony Arasi with GSBA, GSBA will lead a discussion around domains one, three, and four, and five, which are governance structure, board and community relations, policy development, and board meetings. I think at that point we'll be ready for a break. And then uh, after that, we'll come back and Tony will facilitate session, uh, session number uh, three, which is, includes domains six, seven, and eight, which are personnel, financial governance, and ethics. In the middle of that, uh, we'll present the quarterly report, financial report, and then a budget update. It's sort of a, a, an application of those domains. Uh, and then session four is Dr. Susan Browning, along with Jacob Wicks, our director of uh, capital improvements. They are going to update the board on our facility planning, specifically around our renovations and modifications and the five-year facility plan. So the goal is to do all of that by 11. <laughs> uh, so we'll try to stay on, on task. And I'll tell you that uh, they are breaks built into the presentations for questions. So, um, so we'll guide you through that process. But if you have a question you want to ask in, in, in the meeting or even not, if you can jot it down on your notepad, turn it in. Maybe it's something you just want to go offline with and ask a question or follow up on. You have the notepads in front of you, but we'll make sure we, we, we give you breaks. And I was going to ask everybody if you would give your notepad at the end of the session to or whatever your questions were to Michelle, because I'd like for her to put those together and give the whole board answers to those questions if we can. Right. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gregas. Good morning. I, I tried not to take a question. He asked me to go first. <laughs> uh, the last time I presented a 10-minute presentation, it took closer to 30 minutes. So I think he was trying to put some pressure on me this morning. Uh, but I was excited uh, that we got to combine our strategic plan, really talking about board governance today, because uh, Domain 2 Strategic Planning says the governance leadership team, in collaboration with the community, adopts and enacts a planning process that results in an adopted system strategic plan designed to improve student achievement and organizational effectiveness. So I think today, as we go through, 
go through and talk about our process for strategic planning, I think you'll see that this board has met each one of those, collaboration with the community, adopting a planning process with the assistance of GSBA and, and GLSI, GLISI, uh, and then developing a plan to improve student achievement and organizational effectiveness. And your engagement in that process, I think, was exemplary. So this, as we talked about before, was the timeline that we stole from the finance department to outline where we're going with the strategic plan. So this today's goal is to share the process we used, share our mission, vision, and beliefs that were created, our goal areas, performance objectives, and strategy maps that were developed through this collaborative process, and then ask at the end for our board to approve the strategic plan components that you see up there. Uh, as we shared at the start of this process, uh, a quality strategic plan is crucial for the success of our organization. Uh, it sets direction and articulates a plan for improvement. It lets our stakeholders know where we're going over the next five years, helps us measure progress towards that along the way, and it aligns the work of the mission, vision, and goals of the district. So it helps guide our decision making. We can reflect back on what our mission, vision, and goals are. Uh, it helps us prioritize where to spend our time or allocate resources. Uh, it also, in Paulding County, aligns every single department plan that we have. So whether it's maintenance to teaching and learning, each of our department plans at the district level uh, should have a connection to the goals that are outlined in our strategic plan. Uh, at the school level, you see the same thing with our school improvement plans. At elementary, middle, and high school, part of that school improvement plan is showing how it correlates and is directly aligned to the district strategic plan. If you remember, there are four areas that we really look at, four levels of the strategic plan. We've got those strategic goal areas, that big bucket of work. So whether it's operations or teaching and learning, uh, we've got the performance objectives, which tell us what we want to accomplish underneath each of those goal areas. Then we've got the measures and targets uh, that tell us how we're going to monitor our progress towards meeting those objectives and ultimately the goal areas. And then we've got initiatives and action steps. So that's the work of the district and the school staff, what they're going to implement for us to achieve those performance goals at the end. If you look at the continuous improvement process, there are really five steps. So we talk about who are we, where we look at that beliefs, mission, and vision. Uh, where are we now? So taking a status check of where we are, looking at a a number of data points, getting feedback from our stakeholders to see what they think of our progress so far and where they want to go next, which is that third, where do we want to go? And then it's followed by where, when, how do we know when we arrived and how do we plan to get there? Uh, it was important when we met with our stakeholders that we talked about this process not being written just by our district leadership team. So this plan really, when you talk about where we want to go as a district over the next five years, stakeholders have input into that. Uh, there are business partners, there are people in the community that want to talk to us about what they want us to produce for our students over the next five years. When they graduate from Paulding County, they want to be ready for the workforce, they want to be good citizens. So our stakeholders need to have input in that plan development. Uh, so in order to get that feedback and input, uh, we work with GSBA. They were uh, partnered with us at the beginning. Uh, they facilitated these three feedback sessions that you see up there. The first took place on August 24th. If everybody remembers, we did our board SWOT analysis. Uh, I remember that distinctly because I got to sit in that chair <laughs> during that. So I'm scarred for life, I think. Um, but if you remember that day, we did a SWOT analysis where we looked at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, this board kind of set the tone for what they wanted to see as a vision for our district at that meeting. Uh, the next meeting we had was on September 2nd. So we advertised probably for a month and a half uh, with our community, with our business partners, uh, with as many civic organizations as we could to get people to be engaged in this process. So on September 2nd at PB Rich Middle School, we held a stakeholder community engagement meeting. Now, if you remember September 2nd, we had just lifted some COVID restrictions as a state. Um, we actually also had the SEC football kickoff that night. It was a Thursday. Now it was only Tennessee. Easy now. So, Easy now. But that might have impacted that might have impacted our turnout. But we'll honestly, make sure Dee gets you for that. But honestly that evening we had 130 participants. Um, to pull that together on a Thursday night in September when you're not having a student performance and you're not talking about redistricting. We had a really good turnout. We had board members there. Most of you were in attendance that evening. We had community members, parents, teachers, students, 
uh, our county commissioners came, actually our chair commissioner came that evening to participate. Uh, after that was complete on September 3rd through 17th, uh, GSBA opened for us a stakeholder survey. Uh, GSBA likes to comment about our participation in Paulding. We know this, our, our community is very involved in what we do. So we had approximately 2,000 responses to that survey that were given over that two week period. Once that survey uh, was complete and we gathered the feedback, GSBA analyzed and organized that feedback for us. We turned the work over at that time to one of two teams that work on the strategic plan. So we turned it over to the planning team. They work on mission, vision, and beliefs, goal areas, performance objectives, and strategy map. They're that 30,000 foot view of the strategic plan, if you think of it that way. They're looking at the big picture of who are we, where do we want to go. We tried to build, strategically build a team that represented all of the diverse stakeholders that we have in the county, because uh, they're going to chart that course from that 30,000 foot view. We had great response. So, Quite honestly, everybody who we reached out to to be part of this team uh, did their best to, to accommodate that and make time in their schedule. So we appreciate them being part of the process. Uh, we had two board members, Ms. Collette and Mr. Dean, who took time that day to come out. And both were heavily involved that day in the process. Uh, we had teachers and administrators from all three levels, district staff, uh, two county commissioners that came and attended that day, we university partners from both KSU and Chattahoochee Tech, who we partner with frequently. Uh, we had two business partners that participated. They're partners in ed with the district, uh, members, first, members First Credit Union and Greystone Power representatives. Uh, we had parents from all three levels. We had Chamber of Converse representatives. And most importantly, and our two board members can speak to this, we had students that were in attendance. Uh, I've, done, I've got the privilege to do a planning team for three times, three times over the course of my career. I've never seen students that were more engaged, compassionate, vocal, they had no problem with leading some of our groups that we pulled together that day. Uh, but they also saw the big picture. Uh, they were high achieving students, but they were compassionate and knew what they wanted for students across the district. So not just high achieving through students. When they created the plan or helped us create the plan, they were thinking about all of their colleagues. So on October 20th, we pulled that team together at Diane Wright for an all day planning. Uh, it was facilitated by GSBA. Dr. Barker and Ms. Jackson behind me. Uh, they, that team reviewed on that day the board SWOT analysis, so the feedback that you gave them. Uh, they looked at the survey results, the community engagement information. Uh, they looked at our current mission, vision, and beliefs to get feedback on that. Uh, and they determined that day the strategic goal areas, uh, the performance objectives, and develop a strategy map. That's what they were charged to do that day. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but. When we say we gave them data, we gave them about a four inch binder worth of data. I'm not sure if Mr. Dean is finished yet reviewing, reviewing that, um, but we gave them a lot of data to look for. And that's how they get the information on what we need to do. Where are we now and what we need to do next in our plan to accomplish it. So at the end of that meeting, after a very long day, uh, they came up with th this draft strategy map. So you can see off to the left, we had strategic goal areas. They created five strategic goal areas. Uh, around growth, growth and success for all, communication and engagement, attracting, developing, and retaining quality diverse professionals, operational and organizational excellence, and innovative practices and resource implementation. This was the first time that we've ever had five goal areas in Paulding County. We've typically stuck to the four, which I think our GSBA would, would agree is common across the state. But after that was complete, uh, we turned over that work once those goal areas and performance objectives were developed and we gathered that feedback from the community. We, were, we sent this work uh, now to the work of the action team. So this is where it goes from that strategic 30,000 foot view down to the operational level. So what's going to happen in classrooms at the district level? How are we going to measure, set targets for that? And what initiatives and action steps are going to take place? We developed five action teams, so an action team for each one of our goal areas. Uh, GSBA and Glissy like to call these names that you see in white at the top our goal area champions. Uh, they really are champions because this group meets quite a bit. So for growth and success for all, we had Tiffany Frazier, our chief academic officer. For communication and engagement, Jay Dillon, our public information officer. 
for attracting, developing, and retaining quality, diverse professionals. You can just tell that that, that goal area belongs to Ms. White. <laughs> uh, we had Ms. D. Carol White, our Chief Talent Officer, uh, Operational and Organizational Excellence. We had Dr. Susan Browning, our Associate Superintendent. And for Innovative Practices and Resource Implementation, we had Julie Ragsdale, our Chief Information Officer. Uh, this group does a lot of meeting, presenting, meeting again, getting feedback, revising the plans. Uh, but they created action teams that you see listed up there with both district office and school level staff to help them build out that plan. We pulled this group together on December 16th. Um, I apologize, we didn't have pictures from that day, so I reused the picture from the planning team meeting. <laughs> but you can get a bigger view of how big that binder is. Uh, on that day, Dr. Sue Myers, one of our former Paulding County employees, uh, facilitated our action teams through the process. So they had to review our mission, vision, and belief feedback. They reviewed our goal areas, performance objectives, and they began that work on the next step. So updating our mission, vision, and beliefs, uh, updating our performance measures, or creating performance measures and targets for those performance objectives. This is a lofty task, especially performance measures. Uh, they looked at initiatives and action steps that would take place. Uh, so they were really doing the work of those two boxes that you see there. How will we know when we arrived? Measure it. How can we measure it? And then how do we plan to get there? So creating those initiatives and action steps. Uh, as I mentioned, this work is a, very much a process. Uh, just like the beginning where we develop that plan at the onset, feedback is crucial to this team. So we need to get feedback from the people that are going to implement this work. So we want to know, will the initiatives and action steps lead us to meet the performance objectives? Are the performance measures aligned to the performance objectives? If we hit these performance targets, will it tell us that we're on track to meet the performance objectives? So we do this by presenting to a number of stakeholder groups. So our area, goal area champions would present to a stakeholder group, like our executive cabinet, our teacher advisory groups, our principals, our district administrators. And each time they would gather feedback, make revisions with their team, and then represent that process to another group. Uh, so they're champions for a reason. That's why we call them that. Uh, and we put up there just on the screen just a couple of ways that they did that. So we did some face-to-face -face meetings with our principals and administrators, district administrators. Uh, we utilize Zoom a lot when you're talking about taking teachers out of the classroom. We utilize those for our teacher advisory meetings. We shared what was in our plan with them to get feedback. We used what was called the Padlet, uh, which was developed by teaching and learning for us to utilize. So we presented to our uh, teacher advisory groups. They were able to give us feedback through that Padlet. Uh, if we posted that in your board dashboard, I think, for you to see some of that feedback that's taken place. So with all this work that's helped us solidify what we're bringing before the board today, uh, and at this time I want to turn it over to GSBA to talk about the board approval process uh, and to share our mission, vision, and beliefs. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be back with you again. Uh, again, I'm Steve Barker uh, with GSBA. I've got Lanita Jackson with me. We, we do this work together across the state and just want to, first of all, take a moment to commend you for your work. Uh, you know, I remember that meeting. We were here for the uh, kind of the overview and COVID was, was very fresh still. And um, you all were one of the first to kind of stay the course around the strategic planning initiatives and efforts in spite of what we were facing at that time. And I think that speaks to your uh, continuous focus on students and student achievement and doing the work that, that you've been elected to do. So uh, just want to commend you for that. I'm going to take just a moment to speak to this slide um, and just kind of remind you of some of the big things we discussed at that original meeting and when we talked about this process overall. If you look at this, this diagram, on the right side, you see the term strategic and operational. I think those are the two key terms, and I would imagine that uh, Tony Arossi is going to go into that today when you all do your domain discussions. But just reminding you that as a governance team, you're at that strategic level. You're at that thousand foot level. And although everything you hope, every decision you make, you want to make with data to underpin that decision, uh, you're very much at that strategic level, that thousand foot level, um, results oriented. 
as opposed to what you might think of when you think of the member of the governance team that is unique and different, which is the superintendent who you hire as board members who lives very much in both lands, strategic and operational. And that's the individual that you hire to oversee that bottom category, that operational piece uh, of the school system. Think of that as results oriented, but also process oriented. How are we gonna get there? Um, school districts, believe it or not, and you know this very well, they move at a very rapid pace. Student achievement data, audit data, business data comes in throughout the year, much like in your line of work. So the reason I point that out to you is because if you see on the left, your board approval of this plan is at the areas that are in those yellow boxes. That is the big goal areas, those big buckets of work, and those performance objectives, which in a moment you're going to look at the current strategy map. And all that strategy map, that term is simply a visual of those two items, goal areas and performance objectives. And you'll see those in a moment you have them in your PowerPoint. That's the level that you give board approval to the plan saying yes these are the big areas we're going to focus in and these are the big areas that we're going to look to the person that we hire as superintendent to stay laser-like focused with his or her team to move the district forward those bottom three boxes performance measures targets and initiatives and action steps that's the process oriented work that really depends on how the data is looking as it comes in annually that's the work that's going to be done by the superintendent and those goal area champions and the entire staff of the Paulding County School System. So you begin to ask the question, okay, well, we want to, how do those two live together? How does board approval and this piece of, of, of uh, action steps and initiative, how do they merge? Very often it's through quarterly updates on the data that you're looking at to show are we making progress in those big areas. And as I said, the data comes in at different times. So one time a year, the data may be more financial related and another time a year, it may be student uh, performance data related. But you're looking at that data to, de to, to determine how we're we doing in these areas and it allows you then to hold the superintendent accountable for achieving those objectives in the long run. So that's, that's what this diagram refers to. And I think later on today, if I understood right, Mr. Barnett, the board approval of the plan at that area you see in gold is what's gonna be brought before you. Big piece of that is your mission, vision, and beliefs. And I know I think Ms. Jackson's gonna go over that with you now. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be in Paulding with my friends. Um, I wanna say one thing before I go into the vision, mission, and beliefs. Um, one, of the thing, one of the things that we think is really important as GSBA is to be completely transparent. We engaged your stakeholders. We engaged you in doing this, the SWOT analysis. We had the feedback and the community engagement report that was used as a major piece of evidence. And Mr. Dean and Ms. Collette will say that the students paid a lot of attention to that information. But that's so important because that's the stakeholders' perspective. What are the priorities? What's very important? Prior to um, meeting with you all today, we did reconvene that group to share where we landed with any of the changes before presenting it for you all for approval. We think we need to be completely transparent because what you don't want is stakeholders to participate and it looks substantially different at the, at the presentation when you all are actually approving it. So I want to share that with you in full disclosure. Um, and Dr. Gregatis has done an amazing job in putting this together. He did state something that we always brag on you all, I mean, constantly. Your participation is phenomenal. I mean, 130 people at your community engagement meeting in the heat of the pandemic at that point, remember there, the numbers changed a little bit. That says, speaks volumes of your community members. And as well as the online survey with over 2,000 people participating, people really vested, or really completely vested in what, the work that you all are doing here in Paulding. Now I'm gonna talk about your mission, vision, and beliefs. And you have your current here, and I'm gonna go directly to the draft because I'm gonna highlight the changes. I cannot not mention your mission statement, engage, inspire, prepare. All of the districts that we work with throughout Georgia, they said, what are some examples? We share your examples and people want to steal them. 
So we tell them that, okay, disclosure, you have to say, like Paulding, we did this, or you need to change a word or two because they're going to say, how are they taking my information? You have, a, you have a powerful mission statement. Again, when you think about the mission, it's what we do every single day and why we do it. So your staff members are very <laughs> instrumental as a board, bus driver, whatever role you have, you're instrumental in engaging, inspiring, and preparing. So I love your mission statement, and a lot of other people do as well. Um, with your vision statement, um, that hasn't changed. As you can see, the mission the vision have stayed the same. I'm not going to read every last one of the belief statements. I'm going to tell you that in advance because Mr. Barnett did say we have a, a time schedule here. But um, your vision is to prepare all students for success today and tomorrow. When you think about the vision, it's very aspirational. When you think about all, you understand we probably are going to fall short just a little bit, but our goal every day is to be focused on doing what we can to ensure that every single one of our babies in Paulding um, are completely prepared for success today and tomorrow. Looking at your belief statements, I'm just going to share the changes versus the original draft and what was added. You originally had, we believe preparing students is our first pr priority. It was kind of vague in preparing them for what? So I think the need to add for success in whatever their goals are, if it's military, if it's in college, career, we want to make sure that they're successful in our preparation, in our belief statement. You as the board member, as board members, as the governance team, will reiterate our goals to make sure every last one of our students are prepared for success, not just prepared before success. The other um, belief statement that changed is originally it stated, I've got to go back so I can read this. And I have these readers here because I can see very well far away, but up close, I'm like, okay, now I need them. The original one um, stated that we believe students strive best when provided a safe, challenging, and healthy environment. As a result of the um, social, emotional, um, just the mental impact of the pandemic, it was really important that we added a few things to our belief statements because it did change the way we did business as a school district. So it now reads, we believe in providing an environment which is safe, challenging, inclusive, and both physically and mentally healthy. This is direct, this directly came from the community engagement report. The feedback that we received, there's a lot of conversation around the mental, social, emotional, healthy, being more inclusive. So the fact that it's a part of your belief statement speaks volumes. Um, as you're making your decisions, um, a lot of your work is supported by your mission, vision, beliefs. So many times that there are any type of things that take you off task, you can always refer back. This is our mission, this is our vision, and this is what we believe. It has been a pleasure as a part of the Georgia School Boards Association to work with your district. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Brigadis. Thank you. Well, Jason's coming back up. I know Mr. James Clett will remember this, but it's, it's neat that we have now invested so many years in Engage, Inspire, and Prepare. The cohorts of students have grown up in that culture. Y'all remember the students quoting that. Is they, they were against changing it because they're like, well, that's how we grew up. That's, that's, that's the culture we're in, and we, can, it's, it, we need to continue that. So our thought is double down on it and not change it. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, and that just exemplifies that the voice of those students carried. I think as those teams developed our objectives and developed the goal areas, they carried a lot of weight, what the students said and, and how, how they felt during that. So when we look at the final uh, strategic strategy map that we're gonna present today, there really were only just a few minor changes. Uh, so we kept the same five goal areas that the planning team had initially come up with. We did change some of the performance objectives before they ranged anywhere from two to four, but, but our stakeholders' feedback was to keep those really at about three objectives for each goal area. Uh, so if you look at the first one, growth and success for all, uh, the first objective says to improve student academic growth and achievement. Uh, this group really focused and talked a lot about the feedback we have was about growth. So not just achievement. In the past, we've looked at getting students to be on grade level or be proficient. But what the groups talked about this time, we heard overwhelmingly, was they need to be growing no matter where they are. If there are low achieving students, they need to get to where they're achieving on grade level. If there are high achieving students, they still need to grow and be pushed. So that came through a good bit in that uh, objective. The second was to increase or to improve performance of student subgroups. 
This really revolved around our students with disabilities, our economically disadvantaged, and our English language learners. Uh, our third was to improve student college career and life readiness. Uh, the new thing that we see in that, typically you'll hear college and career ready, but that group and, and just the atmosphere of that whole planning team really talked about preparing them for life, so expanding opportunities. They talked about for all students having advanced pathways, talked about CTA, PCCA, um, our academies that we have, having them have mental health and being ready for life and the challenges they're going to face when they leave here. That group, without getting into the initiative too much, talked about developing uh, a profile for what a Paulding County graduate will have when they leave, when they graduate from Paulding County schools, what they'll be able to do, accomplish, and be prepared for. Uh, under community communication and engagement, uh, there is a focus on uh, efficiently, effectively, and transparently uh, communicating with all stakeholders. Uh, once again, all was highlighted in there. Uh, the second one was improving communication and access of information to our diverse populations. This really came out in our stakeholder uh, engagement meeting that the Paulding County community is changing. We have a diverse population of students, uh, so they really wanted to focus on how we communicate specifically around academic programming uh, with our diverse populations. And the last was facilitating partnerships between community and school districts. Uh, this really revolved around expanding our partners in education program, utilizing them to help drive some of the pathways and things that we do in our career academies. For attracting, developing, and retaining quality, diverse professionals, uh, really they had three areas. How are we going to do that? Uh, we know that was a major issue this year in how we retain staff. Uh, so looking at vacancy percentages, how do we make sure that we're getting a staff that represents our community? How do we make sure that we're training them and keeping them high quality? Uh, the second was building staff capacity. Uh, this group really talked about uh, capacity for all staff. So not just how are we growing teachers, how are we growing paraprofessionals, how are we growing administrators, how are we growing support staff? Uh, and then the last one that this group added through feedback was how to develop and implement an effective secession plan. So they really looked at the growth of the district, the need for a secession plan at multiple levels. So they thought that should be its own unique performance objective. <laughs> Under operation of an organizational excellence, this, as you would imagine, gets a lot of feedback when you start talking about the operations of our building. So the first one uh, objective was to develop and implement facility plan to contend with growth and aging facilities. Uh, when we broke out at that planning team meeting to say, okay, go to which goal area you're most driven to, a lot of folks went to operations uh, in organizational excellence. Uh, the second one was building or enhancing safe and effective learning environments. So as we talked about this one, that group really talked about not just safety and security, but also school discipline, also mental health for our students. What is a safe and effective learning environment? And then of course the last, they talked about sustaining excellent financial stewardship. And you'll hear later on uh, in this presentation today about our financial stewardship. Uh, if we don't have good financial stewardship, none of those other objectives can be met. And then the last goal area, which was our new innovative practices and resource implementation. Uh, these groups talked about developing and advancing resources to inspire a culture of innovation. Uh, I can say that our planning team really drove this that day. And I don't know whether it was because we were coming off of COVID, we had done so many things digital, but I think at the time that group was really focused on that what we have to prepare our kids for leaving here has changed. So we have to change internally. We have to be innovative in what we do to prepare them for college, career, and life. So that's where that uh, objective was spawned from. They also talked about building staff efficacy to impact innovative practices. We can't make those big systematic changes around being innovative unless teachers understand the impact that'll have on their students. So that was that second goal. And then last, they talked about implementing innovative programs and practices to engage all students. What are we doing, again, to engage all students? That was probably the reoccurring theme that came across in every meeting that we had, whether it was the community engagement meeting, the planning meeting, our action teams, was that focus on all. So whether all students should be engaged, we should build capacity in all staff, all students should have opportunities, all students should be challenged, all students should grow, all students should be prepared, and all stakeholders should be engaged. So that was really the reoccurring theme that came out during this process. So our next steps in this process would be today to obtain board approval for those areas, that mission, vision, belief, our goal areas, performance objectives, and strategy map. 
Once that's done, our teams will finalize the initiatives and action steps, finalize those performance measures and targets for the next five years. Uh, after that, we'll upload these plans in the balanced scorecard. So that balanced scorecard, we didn't really talk about it too much. That's where those measures will live. So it'll be in assembly for the board to review. It'll be public viewing so they can see how we're making progress towards those measures. Um, and then the work really begins of aligning everything. So our district department plans will now start to align to that strategic plan. Our school improvement plans, which schools will be working on this spring and summer, they will have direct alignment to what we're doing with our strategic plan. And then finally, we'll establish quarterly uh, school improvement plan or district improvement plan uh, updates for the Board of Education. As Dr. Barker mentioned, we get data at different times. Uh, more than likely, we'll start that pro process in August if we get our milestones data back like we expect that we should by that time, that would be the first kickoff for looking at our strategic plan, talking about the initiatives, the action steps, and the performance measures around that growth and student success for all. And then we'll create a schedule of quarterly updates for each. So you've got copies of both the proposed mission, vision, and beliefs and the proposed strategic goal areas. I think uh, Mr. Barnett gave those handouts to you that we'll actually approve later. Uh, I do want to thank GSBA and Glissy for their support uh, during this process. I want to thank all of our stakeholders who gave their time and input into the development of the plan, especially our goal area champions who spent a lot of time there. Uh, and I want to thank the board for taking such an active role in this process, whether it's the community engagement meeting, asking questions, being part of the planning team. So I'm really excited and proud of the plan I think we've put together for the district for the next five years. With that, do uh, anyone have any questions they want us to address right now, or you good to move on? How'd I do? <laughs> Great. One, two, Under an hour. I expected it to be Under an hour. Hours. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaddis. With that, we will uh, ask Mr. Tony Rossi to come up. I think we have a PowerPoint that's going to go along with Mr. Rossi. It's got a little bit of his bio on there. But really, all three of these GSB folks have just a tremendous amount of experience. And they, I, I joke, but I'm really not joking. They really are a dream team that, that we rely on in many different ways. So, And Mr. Rossi is definitely a part of that team. So thank you for being here. Great. Great to uh, see all of you. And uh, we're honored at GSBA to help you in any way we can. Great job by Lanita and Steve uh, taking your district to the next level with your help and the superintendent. I had a little personal interest in this also. Uh, in 2016, Cliff Cole called me. At that time, I was doing what Lenita and uh, Steve are doing and uh, met with myself and someone from Glissy and thinking about really ratcheting up strategic planning, uh, starting with one of the most powerful pieces in the GSBA process, and that is you start with community input. In many places, strategic plans are, are done by staff and possibly uh, approved by the board and then maybe shared with the community. And the power in this process is you actually in inverted the pyramid and you start with uh, community input as it's their plan, as it's their school district. And uh, really uh, appreciated uh, watching and, and listening. I've spoken to Lanita and Steve a couple of times about uh, how pleased they were and how powerful they thought the process was working here. And so uh, kudos to you. But of course, now there's work to be done by the staff. And of course, uh, you'll be getting updates and if the strategic plan is the most important work of the district, and that's the purpose of it, then uh, between agenda items, updates, uh, reports from staff, you will have plenty of opportunities to learn and see what the staff's come up with, how it's going in the schools. And the big piece of this, and I know they've shared with you, is this is much like we uh, preach to the principals that this is a living, breathing process and a document, not something that maybe you put in a notebook and, well, we'll revisit in five more years. So uh, again, congratulations and thank you so much.
Board training. I think you all know that Georgia is one of the few states that requires board training. Some, print, uh, some board members think that's a good idea, some not. I think you all know, just as a review, in 2000, uh, before 2010, districts uh, re receive training at a, at a lower level. And uh, some districts and boards wanted training, some did not. The legislature decided to implement uh, a program where all boards would be required uh, to do training. So there's the requirement piece, but then there is the benefit piece that we hope anytime you get training, uh, if it can make individuals, but more important, collectively, the governance team, that's a superintendent and the board, uh, work even closer together and try to do an even greater job than, than it's worthwhile. And that is the purpose of the, uh, of the training. By the way, we've heard from many board members that it was very nice that the legislature required board members to get training. Uh, they might want to think about having them be required to get trained. So <laughs> didn't want you to think we haven't heard that a few thousand times over the years. So uh, let's, um, let's look at uh, govern the first governance structure. And this is the big one. This is the big one. Now, on one hand, you hate to qua uh, quantify and say one is more important than the other. They also actually all fit together. But I think you know that in terms of governance, the role of the board, the role of the superintendent is a very controversial topic and issue in some districts. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that, the media. Also, you have the accreditation process, and I know uh, the legislature took a look at that, and we're not going to uh, discuss much what the legislature did or should not do, but right now accreditation remains the same as it was, and it's an important piece. Um, but the biggest issue here is the uh, not only about accreditation, but also the tension, uh, sometimes the mistrust, and sometimes the battling that start starts to begin between staff and board members. And so that's why this one, and if you look in your code of ethics, you've, you've all seen them, you'll notice in that one three or four times, and the state dictated that, by the way, your code of ethics had to follow the state's direction. And of course, you, you could uh, and ha have maybe made some uh, tweaks on that but you've got to keep that core. They thought it was really, really important that the issue of the superintendent is the CEO and the board hires and evaluates the CEO in terms of that performance. And obviously the uh, superintendent uh, working with uh, central staff and filtering down into the, uh, into the school. Statewide, we've all seen it. You know, Steve and uh, Lenita also do training and, and in travels. Uh, it's really hard some places to keep everyone in their lane. And you really are a team, but just like a team, you know, you take football, you have, a, you have an offensive lineman has a different role than a running back, okay? And you can take almost any team sport and there are, uh, there's a unity piece, but there's also individual responsibilities. And we, we always talk about the governance structure and, um, and the roles and responsibilities just as a reminder to everybody, because it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Most, raise your hand if you've ever had more than one boss. Raise your hand in, in any of your work life. Yeah, I, I should have said except superintendent. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, okay. Rarely do we though. And uh, the trick here, and I think you know the math, uh, there's seven of you technically um, have hired the CEO, but you have to speak with one voice. And so this can and does create challenges in many places uh, relative to the superintendent and staff are trying to figure out what's the most important work, and I think you've adopted that today 
at the strategy map level, and now the staff will run with it. But it, it's really, really important. That doesn't mean, and you all represent different areas of the county. Uh, you are, um, you're, you have uh, different constituencies. You have different life experiences, and and that is all good in terms of what you can bring in representing the community. But also, it's one in which sometimes has created conflicts uh, for some of the districts. So let me let me ask some of you. And uh, maybe I'll pick on Jeff because he, he he came and said hello to me first uh, this morning. But Jeff, when you ran for the board, how is it different now? And talk about that piece. And I'd love to hear from some of you others in terms of um, the board and the superintendent learning it and then having to explain it to community sometimes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> obviously, as a new as a new person running for the board, you have expectations as a candidate. And then when you get on the board, you realize there's a whole different structure of what the governing process is versus what you anticipate that you're running for as a politician, so to speak. Um, speaking from a board uh, perspective, um, obviously my first year on the board, Cliff Cole decided to retire. And then uh, a couple years later, Dr. Otot retired. And then we had the good fortune of hiring Mr. Barnett. So we've been, I've been through, uh, a pretty good amount of, of retirements and superintendent searches and those kind of things. And uh, it is a good, I think you grow as a board, you grow as a board member uh, when you have the opportunity to work as a team together. And, and like you said, there's there's seven people on a board and some districts have five and some have three, I think. I, I'm not sure about three, I've heard there's three. Five uh, is the smallest. Five is the smallest. And the largest is out in Richmond County, they have 10. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So it's, it's, a good, uh, it's a good thing to learn and, and, res and respect what your fellow board members uh, can bring to the table because there's something you may not be aware of that they can bring and, and vice versa. And, um, and, and I'm proud of our board uh, and where we've come. And, and we've had several board changes. And, and I know Mr. Chester and I talk about this a lot more so, Mr. Chester, that you're always preparing the way for your uh, future board members that we may not know yet. So, you know, you have to put processes in place uh, to, to make it easier for your future uh, future board members because if you don't you can come on the board and be lost that's a great point some districts are growing their own sort of like having a leadership academy but trying to groom some how about others the adjustment from running and then coming on and the reality of serving Anybody? I've been on the board Adam and I have been on the board the shortest amount of time, and um, it is different. I spent a year sitting out there watching everybody trying to learn before I actually came on the board, and, and even that was very different than sitting back here. Um, I think the difference for me really was um, that there are seven people here. We all have different opinions. We come together to make the best decisions, and, and, and the thing that I am very proud of with our board is that we all put what is important first, and that's our students, our teachers, the community. Uh, we're here for a purpose, and we work very hard as a team to accomplish that goal. Anybody else? I'm a doer. Okay. I don't like to check boxes, and the biggest thing I had to figure out when I got on the board was that process that Jeff talked about. You know, there's a reason it's there you can, as a board member, create a significant amount of chaos within the system if you enter into the wrong spot and try to get down into that operational world that you shouldn't be in. And it took a little bit of time. And I got my hand slapped a couple times by Dr. Otot. He's like, you can't do that. And I, it was, so I have a unique uh, um, path to the board. I ran, lost to the board member, and then I, he left and I was appointed to the board. So. Um, I didn't go through the traditional and I came in in the middle of COVID. So all the board training, everything that was available to me, it took a little bit longer to get there. So I had gotcha. to, I guess, I had a little bit of on the job training and uh, uh, learning the hard way. So uh, one of the things that I would say is, is having a, a good ethics uh, uh, what, what do we got? Norms and protocol package That's right. is, uh, is I think very important to a, a board functioning 
in the right way. We are very rarely at odds with each other um, on topics. Uh, we, we don't always agree right. on how we get there, but I, I feel like this board and the previous board even works together, uh, has enough conversation offline and understands what another board member thinks uh, before we come here and air it uh, in, in the wrong way. You know, and so it, that we're never at odds from, because there's a mutual respect among the folks on the board. Um, we don't embarrass each other. We don't try to create problems for each other. It's a it's a, uh, a good working relationship and those norms and protocols are a good thing in which to dictate how we are supposed to conduct ourselves as a board member. Great, anyone else? Yeah, I, um, when I became a board member, um, the greatest thing that I experienced was great mentorship. Um, because, because when I came on the board, we had Dr. McClure, which you remember Dr. Sam McClure, and Dr. Um, Kim Curl, and you know, I was lost because you know I spent 30 years in a classroom, you know, helping kids, and then becoming on this side of business decisions and seeing things in the community that I did. There were things that I saw that I didn't know what to do about. So I would call Mr. McClure and say, "Your name's on this building. Your picture's in the lobby, but." There's no science equipment in the science lab. So what do I do with that information? So he kind of put, talked me through the process of what I should do and able to, in order to connect those pieces. Because, um, and, and we were assigned mentors through GSBA, which was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, but mentorship, I think, was uh, the greatest key that helped me get through those first few years and still you know I mean I think we always need mentors but um, uh, as a school board member there's always going to be resources that we can reach out to within or outside our, our group that <coughs> will help us through so great thank you great great comments and every one of you talked about the struggle between um, running, getting elected, and then actually sitting in the chair and learning the job. And think of the typical citizen out there. Many of them don't know the parameters in which you have to work. And one of the hardest things I've learned uh, since I've been with GSBA, it's been a while, is how difficult it is to educate people about what you can and can can and can't do and should do. One of the challenges is when somebody elects you, they think, well, I told Debbie at church that uh, I'm voting for her and I wrote her a big check for $25, um, told her I support her. So if we have a problem, I know who to call. You know, I, um, I was a high school principal in uh, Cobb County, and I live next to uh, Walton, which was the second high school I was at. I live right near there, and when I'm in the gym or at Starbucks, a lot of my former students come up. They have kids now. And when I tell them I work for the school board, I have to even explain to them what school board members do. And that's because if that tells me a couple of things. Number one, a lot of them are probably pretty happy with what's going on in the school because most people may not know or care what a board member does because the clerk at the school loves my child. We got great teachers, great principal, great school nurse. Think you know this, but your schools are like branch offices for this building. This is the corporate headquarters. And they're the branch offices. So to most people, the district is the kid's school. Now, I worked in the central office for 10 years. And, and like these people, they'll get calls, they'll get emails, they'll get visits. And a lot of times, rarely is that somebody, I wanted to meet with you to tell you, you guys are doing a great job. Okay? It's usually somebody frustrated or not happy with something. And... Uh, that's just the nature of it. 
And we've had some board members burn out because they say, all I do is hear about complaints. Well, remember, you have 30,000 students, right? 30 plus schools. You are one of the largest districts in Georgia, but you may not know this, you're one of the largest districts in the country. If you have 10,000 or more students in your district, you are considered a large district in the United States. There's 15,000 school districts. I don't know your exact number, but you're, you're probably in the top 10%, okay? And don't confuse the fact that you're next door to my district, Cobb, which is mega big, okay? And so is Gwinnett and, and a few others. But you are a large district serving uh, 30,000 kids plus, large employer and everything else. You have a lot of moving parts, a lot of people that could get upset at you. And that doesn't mean if somebody calls you tonight or emails you something about the upcoming graduation, there's always one of those. I always tell people, when I was a high school principal this time of the year, somebody would have an uncle coming in from Ohio and this kid needed 150 on the English exam to graduate and the test was only 100 points. Can you help us? That's a tough one. But don't confuse the fact that what, when you're in the community, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about it, interacting with community in a few minutes, don't confuse the fact that you may hear a lot of things that are going wrong with rank and file, a lot of good things that may be going on, okay? I think that's very, uh, very important. Any other, th any other points to make in terms of that role? Again, that's the biggest pressure uh, when, new when we have new board member training. That is always one of the things, you, you probably heard it too, is people may pick on you, hey, that's the new person. Let's see if we can get that board member to maybe do something the others wouldn't. And it's not that you didn't care, it's you knew that that's administrative decision, not decision of the board. And we've had a few new board members, they get in a bad habit, well, I'm gonna try to fix things. And then all of a sudden, everybody starts calling them and they say, hey, wait a minute. Then they also have, they've uh, created distrust with the other board members. And now the administration is having to clean up some of the things that they've had to do. So a lot of times you, quietly and calmly even have to tell somebody you really like, hey, that's a discipline matter that's handled at the school. You need to work there. And then beyond that, the chain of command is you might call somebody at the central office and go there. But we have no role, no authority on that. And I know that's, that's a tough one, especially when you know people, because they say, I voted for you, Debbie. I wrote you a $25 check. This is what I get. Okay. I think that evolution you talked yes. about, it's a, it's a, we have a unique perspective on that and that we've, you know, board members have come on and yeah, we've had one who's not on the board now, with name or would be anonymous, but who comes in the next day and said, where's my office? Where, where am I sitting? Where, where's my, you know? Yeah. And over time though, that they do, you know, the complexity and the scope, the scale of what we do begins to sort of sink in and, and they kind of round out the edges over time. But it's, it's and that's an evolution really for all of us in a new position, but. It is interesting to see that, that, trans, yeah. that transformation, basically. Great, good. Um, if we could, could we look at uh, number two? Strate just gonna comment on the strategic plan a minute. Um, you're in great shape, I think, for the next five years with a great staff wor working on that. But of course, you'll be uh, getting updates. You'll probably be tweaking some things and so forth. One of the pressures on board members that you got to be careful of is, and I hear it all the time, is, well, you need to raise the bar, raise the bar, raise the bar. Smart strategic planning is not just raising the bar and then, well, later we'll figure out who can get over the bar. It's, you got to look at your staff, you got to look at your resources, you got to look at your teachers. And, Board members sometimes, well, we're, we're letting kids, you know, we should be doing this and teaching that. You need to try to just remember that 
The typical person out there, it's easy to say raise the bar. The hard part is <coughs> lifting and helping the kids over the bar. And that's the job of the staff, the administration, and there will be times when the board will be involved in certain things that has to be done. So, you know, as we're, even as we've talked for, you know, 20 minutes here, you, right away I can tell you've had to develop a thick skin because I can tell <laughs> some of your body language because no one will ever know what you do. No one will ever know what you do. But, uh, and you will go to graduations this week, this weekend, and some of those parents might hear your name and you, you might be mentioned this. They may not personally know you, but you also need to know that you, working with the superintendent and the staff, had a lot to do with those kids getting their diploma. And that's where you've got to get your, your joy and satisfaction. Maybe not everybody made it. That's, that's a school, that's a decision at the school level. That's that kid that needs the 150 on one more test. But the bottom line is that's where you've got to get your gratification and satisfaction. This is why I ran. This is why I do some of the tough things that we sometimes have to do uh, versus people, uh, a lot of people patting you on the back. Uh, you just got to know what you're doing and, and, and uh, making the effort uh, that you can. But um, board community relations, this is, this is, maybe one of the hardest things, because it goes back to what we uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, you're dealing with people's tax dollars and their kids. Those are the two things that could upset them and rile them up. And, and we, have, we have a lot of people upset. You've seen, and thank God you haven't had that here, but you've seen nationally where some board meetings have gotten almost violent, okay? whether it was something about masks or other things, but you, you've seen on the media. And when it's tax dollars and kids, people are gonna sometimes get upset and it's our job to listen to them, uh, see is there, uh, and our critics sometimes are right. We always have to remember that, that's what leadership is about. But also we need to look into, you know, is there anything we could do? Is there anything we, we should do? Um, but there are a lot of people out there that sometimes just want to be naysayers. You know, there's that, there's, you may have heard that phrase, the cave people. Do you have any cave people in, in Paulding <laughs> County? If you don't, they're coming. That's the citizens against virtually everything, okay? <laughs> and and there, are, there are more and more little pockets like that popping up. And what you can do best is to try to work as well as you can as a team and, and try to uh, focus on what's the most important work, the kinds of things we're talking about today, and it, learn to uh, agree, uh, learn to uh, find a, an agreeable way to disagree. So let me ask you this. This is one of the toughest things. So you're out in the community. You'd like to hear from some of the board members, maybe Adam, as once you got into office and maybe you're starting to interact with the community? How did you try, were people asking you for things? Were you just trying to listen or how did that go and how did you manage that? Uh, my experience for talking to Debbie. I don't get a whole lot of phone calls and messages um, maybe because I'm the new guy and nobody really knows who I am yet. But um, when I do occasionally get the message, I always refer back to Dr. Otot or Dr. Barnett to make sure I'm not overstepping my bounds and trying to promise things that I can't really give to people because you want to make sure you're setting the right expectations up front um, so that you don't end up in a situation where you said, oh yeah, I'll get little Timmy out of trouble and then you really can't. So. <laughs> okay. How about you, Mr. Dean? You've been... Yeah. Um... At first, it was hard to adjust, and I'd like to say amen to Mr. Fuller's comments about the expectations of when you're running for office and actually when you get elected. Um, totally different world, uh, different ballgame. You ought to have a training class before you run, even. Um, when I get a call, I've, I've found that it's 
First of all, it's not my place to be talking to the staff out here. I just try to send it to Steve and say, here's a problem, you know, just keep me briefed on what's going on. Um, I do like to push uh, certain initiatives and stuff that I like, uh, or feel passionate about, uh, school security, mental health, uh, stuff like that. And just keep a focus on it. But there's a fine line between keeping a focus and stepping over and going to Julie, for example, and asking for help on computers at a school or something. So there's, you really have to watch it. A lot of times, though, I've found that the public, and this has happened recently, will think that, oh, I want this done and we need this done for our benefit or the community. And there's, it's totally absurd and they expect me to process their request. And, and I can't do that. I said, you've got to go do this, this, and this and present it through the proper channels. Don't even recommend dieting as the side. best way to slim down. I feel the same way about cleansing. And even though you go to the same church with them, to turn it off. you can't do favors for them. <laughs> and you shouldn't do favors. You can't do it and you shouldn't do it. So, Yeah. You know, anybody else? You know, board members have asked sometimes, well, when am I not a board member? Well, that depends on your community. If they want to talk to you after church, uh, they want to stop by your house, happen to just be in the neighborhood, uh, that's part of you, you representing a uh, constituency. And, you know, that's, that's one of the big challenges, too, that, um, that I think you understand you face. Uh, you can just be very polite <coughs> to somebody. Let's say somebody at church says, uh, I think you said they were asking you, could we do, I don't know, was it a facility thing or a... Close, yes. Okay, so let's say... Let, this facility thing. And you might say something, well, you know, we have a new strategic plan. And at some point, they might be looking at facilities. And we have a, also, we have a facility plan. And, uh, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. Now, the wrong person might say, hey, I talked to Mr. Dean at church today. They're looking at what we were talking about. Then that person tell somebody that and now all of a sudden something is being built okay there's no credence to any of it but that's how and you were just polite but once in a while somebody will say hey well i'll check on that for you or uh i'll follow up on that that can be an that that could be a, a easy way for you to kind of you know um end the conversation politely but you can't control how that person takes it. And then before you know it, there's a whole rumor that next Saturday at the soccer field where a bunch of the parents are together, all of a sudden they're announcing there's a new something that may not have any chance because that might not be a need that you as the board and the superintendent had to look at because you've got 30 plus other schools and facilities to look at. Something that was helpful in that particular situation is I told him I would follow up. So I followed up by calling Mr. Barnett and asking what the procedure was and then told him what the procedure was to go follow that, that we didn't handle that at, at the board level. So basically I passed the book but was polite about it. So. Yeah. I think it's important to just stick to the facts, right? Yeah. You know, when you get asked the question, you pick up the phone, you call Steve, and you get the, the, the right answer, or you call the right person. If you're going to give that information to somebody, make sure it's the accurate information. That's, I think, important. I've said a million times, as I don't have a magic wand or I don't have the power to do that. In fact, most every communication I have with somebody who's a parent or a stakeholder or a taxpayer is, hey, I don't know if I can help you with this, but I'll ask the question. Mm -hmm. And I'll get somebody to get back to you. And I think that's, you know, I think that's what people want to hear. They just want to get to somebody who may or may not be able to help them, but are willing to listen to them. Nine times out of ten, if you just let them talk, that, that does it. Yeah. But you've given them a process that kind of aligns with the chain of command. That's, that's a great response. Now, that might not have made them happy. They may have wanted. But you've done, that parent did what they had to do when they approached you you then responded in a way that's in the best interest of the whole board and, and the superintendent. And then 
uh, see where. Um, I think it's important that we follow up with people who contact us. Right. You know, it, it, and I do this if, if, if anybody here knows I, if I copy them on an email, I, the last sentence is, please let me know where we came with this so that I can follow back up with the person, make sure they got the phone call, make sure that they, whether they like the information or not, they, they got an answer. Okay, good. Any other challenges out in the community, out and about, particularly when you began your service? Did you learn to function with that? Mr. Dean said something yeah. uh, 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 earlier, and uh, I don't know if GSBA does this, but I think anybody who, who signs up uh, uh, in the primary to run for a school board seat, uh, yeah. or, or frankly, well, school board is what we control, but it'd be great for them to come sit with GSBA yeah. uh, and the district to have a two hour, hey, this yeah. is what a board member really does. I think um, it would encourage some people, some more people to run yeah. and discourage. It, it, I think it would be helpful to the community to have that as a resource. I don't know if we can do it as a school board or how we do it or a school district. but. We, we're glad to help with that, and we, do we've done do with that? a couple of districts, we've even had a forum if they might have a handful of people. Um, did that not too long ago where a district had a, it was a large district, and they had a number of people who were considering running, about eight of them, and so we just literally went there, and we talked to them, and afterwards, some people said, Wow, I'm glad I came to this. I know I want to be on the school board. Others said, I'm glad I came to this. This is not what I thought being on the school board would be like. But we, you could have candidates call. We, we have resources. We, we'll talk them through it. We'll send them stuff. We're, we're glad to because the more people understand the role, uh, the better everybody is. You know, and we're not the board police, okay? We we're, we're trying to help school board members and superintendents uh, work together, uh, work together as a team. Uh, a, yeah, please. I know at one point um, there was some general information GSBA put out, um, but it was more about the, the job description and duties of school board members. And I think that's, that's it may be still available. Yeah. I don't know if it's as widely distributed as it, as it um, probably should be. Yeah. But I know that was done at one point. Right. We, we now, the, too, might give them a sample code of ethics. Yeah, some of the issue with that, though, yeah. is any person who had not yet been elected receiving training from GSBA or training the board pays for um, especially if it's anything similar to the training the board actually pays for, yeah. for members, then that person's receiving a benefit and they're not in office. And it's a benefit. It can be seen as a contribution because training is normally paid for by the board. But the person who isn't in office yet and hadn't yet won is receiving a benefit that somebody normally would pay for for free. Does that make sense? So. Yeah. Somebody may construe that as a contribution. Yeah. I think we err on the side if somebody's thinking, run, good point, but if somebody's thinking running for school board, we'll try to get them information. We also would do what um, uh, Ms. Collette apparently did. You know, why don't you sit in on some board meetings? You know, board meetings are not really exciting. Okay, you look, and I, I know you, you probably like that, okay? I was on the superintendent's cabinet in Cobb for 10 years, and, and we, had, uh, we had some doozies sometimes. But the truth is, it may not seem exciting, like uh, on an agenda you might order, be ordering paper products. Now that doesn't sound really dynamic and why you wanted to come in and change lives, but ha that has to do with safety and cleanliness and, and a cl school climate, okay? So, um, but the other thing is I understand you televise your meetings. And so some could uh, peek in that way to get an idea. Uh, 
I think it's great that many people who decide to run, they, they want to, you know, change lives dynamically, and that's good. But you're maybe not going to come in, you know, uh, and just this one thing is going to change everybody's lives. The schoolwork is a hard business. It's hard business. You know, we got to get them there. We got to keep them safe. We're feeding kids now more than we ever have. Do you, and I know you know this, some of your kids, the best meal they get is at the school. Now, what does that tell you? Even uh, more powerful, some of the most affection and care they get is at the school. And we're trying to teach them geography and math. And we're doing a tremendous job. We, we don't get everybody, we're in an imperfect business but we keep trying, keep trying to get better, and uh, we can maybe impact more uh, in, in many different ways. Anything else dealing with uh, community members? Yeah, please. I think one of the important things to remember, especially in a community like ours, is that sometimes it's just a difference People in the community just sometimes have a difference in beliefs about governance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things you, you, you learn being in office, you learn running from office, that <clears throat> sometimes it's just a, a difference in governance and difference in philosophy. Um, and, that, and that has to mesh with, with your community and you know, with, different, right. with other board members. So um, it's not necessarily a right or wrong, it's just that, okay, you know what? Um, a person running for office has to figure out rather shortly and then figure it out again when they, if they win, that, okay, um, there are certain things that would benefit our community that may be good for kids, but if your philosophy is, okay, but that's not the role of government to do those things, and I don't believe that's the role of the taxpayers to pay for certain things. And others may believe, okay, well, the school system has money, you should do it all. But it, and it's, and it's, you know, that's a difference in governance philosophy. And it's not one more right or wrong than the other, but in some communities, you know, their boards are more activist. They are more inclined to spend right. a lot more taxpayers' money on certain things. And in some communities, like in, in ours, which I believe it's ours, you know, we're a little more conservative. We may have the resources, but we don't spend them. And that's not a difference in, in you know, really core beliefs. It's just a difference in governing and governing philosophy. So, and that sometimes, you know, comes up. Good point, good point. Again, community, big rule we, we try to uh, always encourage with our new board members god gave us two ears and one mouth and that is as we're interacting with community members listen is there something you can learn that might uh be important uh that needs to come to the attention of principals superintendent other board members and just be careful what you say uh, you can't control some people say, well, I saw Mr. Dean and he said, we're getting this, this, and he said nothing like it. People have a right to say what they want, but you can many times, being careful what you say, uh, can maybe make a difference in rumors spreading and, and other kinds of things that then have to sort of do damage control when you maybe didn't necessarily have any bad intent. Tony, okay. would you say that... Uh most boards you work with live somewhere between policy and our performance objectives we just went through. In other words, like, you know, well, those who've been on the board know from a budget perspective, I would say all the time, and if something came up during the budget process that didn't fit into a performance objective, there was a disconnect somewhere yeah. with the community being filtered through a board member. But it feels like part of the, you know, part of the work that we did with these, with these objectives was Again, if they're hearing something in the community that doesn't fit in one of these objectives, something, you know, there may be one-offs, but I'm talking about if they're consistently hearing something that doesn't fit into an objective, then we, something broke in the process. I, I, so far, I feel like when I get approached with, 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 with issues, they, they do fit gotcha. in one of these. 
And mm -hmm. so I, you know, it gives me a chance to kind of revisit that objective and let them understand sure. the process, not necessarily with the board, but I'm talking about with, with parents and so forth. So there is like an avenue. Yes. If it's a performance issue, you got these right. objectives. If it's a policy issue, you obviously the board right. has its policies. Great, great point. And that, that takes us to the policy piece. Let's talk a little bit about it. That's one of the most important thing the board does. Then the superintendent and staff uh, implement the policies. Um, and that was a great segue there as, as uh, we, we talked about those performance objectives. The big issue with policy we see with some board members is you have a, a, let's take a discipline policy, and that's about safety, uh, and that's about school climate, about a lot of things. Uh, and you might get a call or someone inquires to you, well, I know that's the policy, but he or she's never been in trouble before. He or she, um, you know, didn't mean that. You'll hear different things. Any of you get any of those, Jeff? Have you gotten, how, how do you work through that stuff? Yeah, there's a pot, you have a policy on the books, board does policy, and yet someone doesn't like the implementation of the policy. I'm using an example as a discipline matter. Kids suspended maybe a week. Um, and the policy calls for that. You know, I, uh, I should say I, I haven't really gotten many phone calls on okay. discipline. Okay. Um, maybe throughout the six years, I probably hear more. I, I, you know, I don't think I have. I don't even think okay. I have one. Uh, I, I hear it from my kids because they're in school. They're like, "Hey, is my buddy going to show up on your no-no list?" You know okay. what I mean? So, gotcha. it, okay. it's <laughs> you know, I hear it from that, and then I can't tell them. I'm like, I have no idea. Okay. Um, but but. I want to say maybe there was one instance a few years okay. ago somebody called, but I, I do, I'm prepared. If I do get that call, I tell them, listen, you know, I, I can't talk about this because there's a process and if you want me to help you along the way or you want me to be open-minded is really, you know, of the open-minded process. I can't listen right now. I need to be able to hear it at the end. And that's something Mr. Cable has trained us well on, Good. Uh, you know, that we know that you don't want to hear the evidence until you're supposed to hear the evidence. Because then you can't make a judgment call. You'll have to recuse yourself from the, the actual vote. So okay. I do, I have expressed that, but I, I can't say that I've had any. Any others? It happened to me two weeks ago. We just went through the whole, went through a whole thing where somebody got disciplined at a, at a school and had to deal with it. And uh, I had to tell the, I got called from the mother. I got called from the father. I got called from the grandmother. Gra oh, grandma. grandma. That's, that's yeah. tough. Yeah. Yeah. They, go to, grandma they go to grandma. This series. Gra grandma eight states away. So, uh, yeah, I, and I had to say, hey, you know, no, you're going to have to go back through the school. That's a that's a in-house thing, and I, I have I do not have the power to deal with that. The same thing here. I've had numerous calls. Numerous. Um, okay. Bottom line, I go straight to Mr. Barnett and say. Here is what has happened. I tell that individual, you've got to start. There is procedure, and you've got to start through those procedures. They don't like that. Uh, but I think someone said earlier, the biggest key, I think, is that we listen. Right. And, that, and give them that opportunity for that voice mm -hmm. and let them know right up front that, you know, this is the procedure and this is what has to happen. And, and sometimes I get the follow-up call because it didn't go the way they wanted it to go. Gotcha. But I would say I've had a handful of those calls, but most every situation, they drop me like a hot potato once they found the track and they feel like that they're getting what they are, at least they're being heard, heard. through that That's process. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've, I have to go back to Mr. Barnett or to the staff to say, did this get handled? Or they come back to me and say, this is what happened. Because I rarely get that parent or grandparent that calls back, uh, or in some cases, a community person, baseball coach or something that calls me about a situation that says, um, you know, they rarely call me back to give me the follow up. Well, Kel, well, I think what we most of us hear is, is when they didn't get the answer they wanted, they go to social media and they go scorched earth. And then we get calls from eight other people wanting to know why we didn't handle it the right way. And very rarely do those calls, when we get them, 
uh, contain the proper information. You know, that, that is the biggest thing I think I've learned is, is you got to find out what's going on at the school level through staff before you can react. Uh, you, you need to understand the playing field first. Good. Well, there, there's another thing I want to add to that, too, because it, it reminds me of, of a circumstance that, you know, we can't talk about, but I'll give you the generic. Um, <clears throat> there, was a, uh, there was a parent that was upset with several board members just in general, um, you know, because they weren't getting the feedback from the board that they wanted to get. And I had to explain to the parent that when you say the word lawyer, you say the word sue, you just took our ability to communicate with you out. You know, so there, there's a way, there's a way that we should communicate with the parents, but they need to communicate with us so we know how to handle it. But when they say, Sue, I have to immediately turn that over to him or if they threaten that, not that we have been, but you know, that's the first thing parents would go to is we're, we're going to get, you know, this, you know, involved in that. So, so communicating that to the parents or communicating that to the, you know, that, that, Hey, once you mention that, that legality part, you're not going to get any of us to be able to communicate on that level anymore. Okay. So, so don't bring, does that make sense? Is, yeah. I mean, good. good point. One, one real quick yeah. positive sure. outcome from, from somebody saying something about our policy. And I believe Ms. Lyons is the one that initiated this idea. We had a discipline issue. And um, after that process went through, we realized that we could improve our policy. And we went back and looked at it and actually did make a small change Good. in our policy. So, and I, I th I've always just been really impressed with, with how we said, well, you know, Yes, it's black and white, but maybe we ought to give a second chance at getting in the right category. So, yeah, and, and you know, your lawyer advises you on it, but you know, uh, if you have a policy that says the principal may suspend you for, uh, you know, two weeks, that's a lot different than will, you know. So, but. That's really just like the strategic plan policies. Don't you don't need to be turning them over every year the whole policy manual. But your lawyer will be working with you if he hasn't already. Uh, you know we had a lot of stuff, interesting stuff from the legislature that we're going to have to try to implement. Uh, plus, your principals may have given Steve and the administration a, a couple of suggestions about maybe some. Uh, policy tweaks where there's flexibility in terms of what you do versus it being a man mandate. Yes, Nick. I think one of the things that's important, and I don't think it was mentioned, is in terms of policy development. Um, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm proud of, have been involved in since I've been elected, is eliminating policy. You know, there, there, there is a habit sometimes. <clears throat> for boards to add on and add on and you know there's some school systems that's policy manual is probably four times larger than ours and, a lot of redundancy. and it's a lot of redundancy and it's language on top of language and so in terms of policy development that is one of the key areas that I always look at and I think is important for boards and board members is okay you know, there are things that don't belong in policy, they may be redundant or outdated. And what, what we always talk about and try to do and, and try to point out is there are certain things that, I don't wanna say push it down, but it should not be policy. It is more um, better situated as a administrative rule because it needs right. to be flexible or changeable and it doesn't belong yeah. a, in a policy, so. Good point. Well, I, I can tell you that the trend and maybe um, your, uh, Mr. Cable would want to comment, but the trend for a while there was to put everything in policy. And then I think people felt that that might corner you many times and that if you really want flexibility, and would you say the trend has been less policies? Yes, and I'm, and I'm happy for it as the attorney for the district. You know, <laughs> gotcha. The policies do that. They tie their hands. And okay. so I've always gotcha. talked to them all the time about don't tie your own hands. Okay. We were talking I did want about, to say, yeah. um, I remember when I first became a board member, and Mr. Cable was the only one around back then, but um, when Clark Maggart became our policy guy, right. the, 
first thing he did was purge our policies. Our policy was manual, was this big. And he, we spent weeks, maybe even months, just every board member meeting, he would bring all these purge mm -hmm. uh, uh, suggestions, gotcha. recommendations okay. to us because they were redundant or right. outdated or just archaic or whatever. But um, that I think that uh, when we do try to say, oh, we need to put this in policy, Mr. Cable always says, well, we want the least restrictive most of the time. And the, I th the what you said earlier, when, we, when people come to me and they say, my kid's never been in trouble, they've been a straight A student, they're all honors, you know, and they just made a mistake of bringing a, something to school that was somewhere between a, a squirt gun and a, right. a paintball. Gotcha. But you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Is that a felony? As of right now, the child is being charged with a felony. Now, there are some, and, and uh, zero, and I'm gonna give you guys a break. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them a break in a minute. Um, you know, and the lawyer could talk more about this uh, to you guys later, uh, but for a while, there was a lot of kids disciplined our understanding, we were trained when I was in Central Office, a lot of kids around the country were disciplined. Sometimes the PTA president's mom, kid, did the same thing as the poor, the kid lives on the poor mm -hmm. side of the tracks, who maybe looks different. Mm -hmm. And that kid got suspended for two weeks. This kid, well, we'll keep an eye on you, don't do it again. And that's that's some of how zero tolerance came mm -hmm. and that's not perfect neither right but okay about 10 five or 10 minutes steve what do well, you we think? got one more if we can hit that next debate. yeah okay uh, but tony let me ask because uh, you and i've talked a lot so yeah. this is a leading question but in our in our conversations would you agree that you, when you think about the legacy of a board that uh, that policy really will outlive you know, it'll live longer than, than your strategic plan, definitely longer oh, yeah. than a one-year budget. Yeah. And, and uh, it, you think about what will outlast that you guy, That guides, that guides really everything. That's your staff, that's your um, students, uh, that's volunteers. And I mean, policy is everything. And, and yet, can you, maybe reduce some if there's redundancy or gives you more flexibility, but still have a strong structure of policy. Because policy does outlast the strategic right. plan, even outlast really a, the average superintendent's what, three years, <laughs> 10 years, yeah, three, four, five right. years. Definitely yeah. outlasts the budget. Uh, that's one of the reasons that in the budget this year, I think we've talked about this with the board, is that we've hired GSBA to do a policy review. Okay. Uh, Kind of what, like you were talking, about, Teresa, with a with a sort of a deep dive and audit, yeah, and and Clark, Clark did, week, yeah. I mean, to come along beside Jason, I mean, it, it, it's a lot of work. They have a department that really specializes in yeah. that, and so we we we're going to engage them. They do them for quite two, about two thirds of the di of districts. Could you go to the last one? I'm just going to take two minutes. Yeah. Uh, the next one, board. Yeah, your board meetings. Remember, and I think you know this, but but they're the one time you really are a board. I mean. Technically, board members have no power other than when you're sitting at a meeting and you're voting on the superintendent's recommendations. That does not mean, though, that you don't have influence in the community, okay? Doesn't mean you have inf don't have influence, but in terms of power, but that's why some people do call you and think you can fix something. Uh, but the board meetings, they're really, uh, they may not always have a lot of exciting topics on there, but that's the business of serving the schools, serving maintenance, taking care of budget. Uh, it's the business of, the, you know, this is the corporate headquarters, like I said, of, of a large entity that has 30 branch offices there. And so how efficient you are becomes very, very important. And a lot of that is what's voted on and, and, um, and discussed at your board meetings. Preparation's real important. The staff I know works really hard getting you as much information as you need to make uh, a good sound decision on something. And we hear some board members want, you know, they want the gone with the wind version, you know, on, on every item. 
and uh, but you also got to remember that there's got to be a balance there and, and that's try to let the superintendent and staff determine that and then if there might be an item or two once in a while that you think you need more information I know that they, they'll they'll get that to you uh, the other thing is once in a while we'll have board members maybe show off a little and particularly when you're on TV um, uh, there might be a constituent out there that's been complaining about something uh, and the right way to handle that is refer it to the administration to check on it but sometimes a board member might at, at a, a meeting maybe uh, m make a larger issue of it when maybe not all the facts are in yet does that make sense and so that's that's real important same thing even with the staff once in a while that if you didn't maybe think you got enough information on something uh, it, that might be better handled after the meeting for future reference versus you know at the meeting uh, uh, we've had we've had cases of that where there becomes a, a lot of tension between the staff and the board member um, mainly not that they maybe wanted more information or different clarification and that's you know if uh, if you want something clarified that's one thing but new information uh, like that is not really good for a lot of reasons number one all the board members should get it and the staff should have time uh, to vet that also um, so uh, any other comments on your board meetings if they're not well attended that's normal that's probably a good sign other than when there is um, awards recognitions and or a controversy and as many of those as you could try to avoid the better five minutes or ten board chair yeah uh what would you Take, like let's do ten ten yep we'll we'll move into a ten minute recess then we'll finish up and we'll be done by 11. okay we're back in session okay thank you let's go to uh next area the standards and this is always an interesting one this is uh, personnel um, and th this relates to you know setting the direction you want for the superintendent particularly with seven of you like we've said um, it's interesting with board size board size um, we have an interesting dynamic in our uh, in our state we have almost 170,000 students in Gwinnett and they have a five member board our smallest board is Tolliver County they have 180 students in their county and they have a five member board so uh, the size and I think most of you know the um, size and the representation uh, is determined by your local legislative delegation okay and that that's done uh, county by county but um, you know you hire and evaluate uh, your CEO the superintendent very very important but then also uh, working with the superintendent in terms of recommendations for personnel particularly in some of the smaller communities there's a lot of pressure and I don't know if that's occurred with any of you I'd love you to share some of the smaller communities there's a lot of pressure on board members uh, who maybe get calls from constituents about their son or daughter graduating and and looking for a job and could you uh, help with that okay uh, we know of no reason that board members can't encourage we love to get a lot of great applicants we really do our human resources department will compile that and they have a process and a procedure to determine who meets the qualifications who might get interviewed and in the end uh, the administration would bring those recommendations bottom line is I don't have anything to do with whether your son or daughter would get hired but if you think they'd love to work in our district we're always looking for good applicants but I and none of the other board members uh, will have can have anything to do with that and the superintendent won't even get involved until the HR folks have done the background check and all the other stuff and somebody might 
be put off by that because I voted for you, Debbie. I keep picking on you. And I thought I'd get a better answer than that. And that is the best answer you can give based on um, the oath you took and what's in the best interest of the rest of the board, your, your superintendent and your board attorney. Okay. And we've, you know, we've had a few battles with that. Uh, when I say battles, we didn't battle, but we sometimes have to go in and, and do some extra work with, with uh, boards where, where there's been something uh, that's happened uh, relative, relative to that. Any of you um, comments on the personnel process? You're a, big, you're a big employer. Like I said, you're one of the largest districts in the state country and uh, I know you're continuing to uh, look at your processes and you saw one of the big buckets in your new strategic plan will be uh, uh, in the end wasn't named that but trying to find the best and brightest to to work with your kids okay I have yeah my understanding of that process is if anyone comes to us and wants a job we our the way we instruct them is apply for the job we can't help you get a job but we can ask that your application be looked at that's, now that I'll, I'll defer that to maybe uh, hr and or that's been Steve, my understanding Steve, yeah we can't we don't get in trouble for that but that's all we can do i'm hurt i had a different understanding but i'm uh, I think without my understanding are you are, I'm sorry are you looking at me oh no I didn't know if the you you have the floor should you like <laughs> to choose to take it Ultimately, um, it's, <laughs> I, it's 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 kind of a it's a good thing to be one of the largest employers in the county um, but it also means I think out of all the systems you deal with things differently than smaller counties, obviously. Um, and one of the things that I learned, and I actually learned this at a conference and that one of our, I guess, national conferences, is I was, I was sitting at the table and I was talking to a board member from um, Joliet, I think that's the name of it, in Illinois. Illinois, yep. And she was talking about their um, union contract and negotiating with their, their union or payroll and different things. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well, hell, that's, <laughs> that's a whole different animal and I'm thankful we don't have that. But what I learned was that um, even asking someone to take a look at an application can sometimes, sometimes it is a um, uh, skewing the process and it, and it skips steps because there may be certain steps that HR has in place that says if there are not certain criteria, for instance, then we don't, we don't have the ability to look at a thousand applications. If one of the job requirements is you must have a CDL, this person does not have a CDL, <clears throat> and that helps them eliminate a hundred applicants. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. a board member says, hey, well, this person called me, I know them, take a look at it. And now that person has bypassed one of the steps that was put in place to efficiently get the best person for this position, yeah. then that, that is one of those things that can twist that process because HR may have said, look, we don't even look at anybody's application. If they don't have a CDL, it's a waste of our time. But as a board member saying, oh, well, take a look at my cousin's application yeah. when he doesn't even have a CDL, and you put additional work on the system and you bypass, you know, sometimes it's a small step, but it is a step in the process intended to get the best personnel for the system. And yeah. even that small thing is sometimes enough to, hey, okay, now let's look at everybody who didn't even have a CDL yeah. because we looked at the one person who didn't have a CDL and now instead of reviewing 500 yeah. applications, we're reviewing a thousand and you know, it warps the process. So that's the way I yeah. learned about it. Our suggestion, that doesn't mean your district has to do it, is that you can encourage people to apply and then period. You know, and probably, now, 
to, to Nick's point, he brings up a good point. One could argue that HR, you looked at the application and you saw they didn't have a CDL. So you kind of did what she said, but I think, and I'd want to hear the district's opinion, you may want to just stop right there and not, because particularly with a district your size, you may get so many applications. It is pointing them to the process of HR, which is really well established yeah. and set up, but I think it's a great point that uh, Mr. Chair is making, and that is the weight of the voice of the superintendent. I mean, uh, yeah, that too, but, the, but a yeah. board member in the sense that uh, whether you're out in the schools or, or you're speaking to a prospective yeah. you know, employee, the, that, that weight is really there. It's a real thing, and so it's, it's, I would be careful. I would just direct them to the process. Yeah. Establish yeah. Themselves in yeah. What, what, what is it we've heard the last couple of weeks? Implied authority. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Well, that's I'm sorry. From the very beginning, <laughs> and over however many thirteen years, I've paid probably twice exercised that, you know, little bit of authority that we could just just look at it if you don't mind. And I mean, it was never someone who was not a, a qualified for the position. But if it's something that we should not do, I need to know that because um, my understanding was that that was allowable. Uh, my, my advice would be that you, just, you would direct, you would certainly encourage the application and you encourage to make people you want to apply. But I would probably fall one step short of saying, you know, I will look at it or we will look at it and just simply say, you know, we'll, we'll go through the procedure. And of course it will be looked at, you don't have to say that, but I mean, of course, it would be evaluated just like all of them. But what I think is important from a legal standpoint is that everybody gets treated the same in mm -hmm. terms of the process. So mm -hmm. You don't want to create a, a situation where that person feels like they're getting some kind of elevated or special mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know because um, well, that's why that's we have discussion. It, it's, yeah. it's, you know, w one might argue that that's a tiny difference, but with the wrong person, it could end up maybe a legal problem too. And that's just part of, uh, that's just part of the, uh, how people take what you said. You know, we, we used examples in a couple of areas. Um, let's talk budget real quick, financial governance. This is a huge one. You have a really big budget. You have one of the biggest budgets in the state probably in the country because you're one of the bigger ones. I think 350 million is your general fund. Now, what comes with that? Well, there's probably some teachers in the community that think we ought to reduce class size and parents want to reduce class size. It's one of the, uh, it's one of the things when people are running again for the, on the seat, the, uh, the incumbent knows the budget and the budget limitations. And, you know, you know that a new teacher costs $90,000, okay, one new teacher. Now, imagine trying to reduce class size, even one or two kids. That's millions and millions of dollars. Would that make a difference? We don't know. You know, a lot of research will tell you that if you can get it down to 14, 15, maybe that's where it's impactful. Well, um, it's hard to do. It, it, it's hard to do. Um, but sometimes people in anger will say, my God, they have $350 million in that budget. They couldn't do such and such. They couldn't add a power pro or they couldn't do this or they couldn't do that. And what they don't know is all the other parameters you're working with. The typical person has no idea that 85 to 90% of your budget is just personnel. They just think, wow, that's $350 million. I guess they'll shuffle the deck this spring and they'll figure out how do we spend that $350 million. And then you've got other no-brainer costs like utilities and other stuff. The typical person out there thinks you have wiggle room from the floor to the ceiling in the budget when your wiggle room's about this big. And so that makes it even harder that's where your strategic plan's really important because you have so few dollars where you can have some flexibility that um, you've got to be more informed. You've got
a study more, what, what the staff sends you, and you got to really think hard on where are we going to spend that money, and that's where working with the superintendent and staff and their rationale for that is is uh, very important. That's another thing I think, you know, just like we've said, all of us, we wish you could explain to people what the board member can do and has power to do and not do. And imagine if we tried to have a meeting one night here and said, come learn about the role of the board and the superintendent. It's a really important process. Unless all the TVs electricity was knocked out in Paulding County. You might get a couple of relatives to come, maybe, because you bribed them. But that just ain't, that ain't gonna bring people here. And so you've gotta educate, like some of you have, person by person when you get an opportunity to. You, you just can't. And the longer you do it, and the more constituents you have, They've probably figured that out if they've talked to you and approached you. But it's very hard, it's very uncomfortable uh, when, when new people uh, come, into, uh, come into the position. But this is a tough time and it's a critical time, but you, you're gonna need to have educate uh, the community relative. Have you board members the last year or two had any particular issue come up related to budget that people have tried to press you on or inquire on, or are they pretty much trust in you on it? I think, I think we've had a couple. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I think we've had a couple, but I think, you know, for me, a lot of it goes back to explaining or trying to explain what your governing philosophy is and sometimes it just means um, no and not seeing eye to eye with yeah. some individuals right. some groups um, that's just you know and that, it's not a a high level discussion sometimes right. it's just no it's yeah. not it's not the priority of our community or it's not in keeping with the way our community operates and uh, I, I, I feel someone this was recently. Now, I, I explain it the way I talk about, you know, things with my son. And uh, we were out looking at TVs and, uh, you know, my son wanted me to buy a 70 inch or something huge TV. And I told him, I said, well, you know what? That's not what we need. That's not how we do things. And maybe I can afford it, but that's not the whole point. Point is that's not, you know, gotcha not how we spend our money and spend our resources. So, so sometimes that's, you know, it, it is, it goes back to the governance style and structure. It's okay, right. you know, we may have the money, we may have the resources. Yeah. We don't spend it in that way on those things. So. Good. Just be careful when you're out in the community. Uh, you know, the too tangible thing, most citizens, most people don't get into the strategic plan or the roles and responsibilities or, you know, other than discipline policies, maybe they see in their student parent handbook. But the two tangible things that they think they know a lot about are buildings, because they see them, and money, because it's money. And so just particularly in those two, and we're going to be uh, talking about facilities in a moment here. Um, last piece, and then I'm gonna, uh, we're going to uh, have the facilities discussion, and then I'll close w uh, when we're done with that. The ethics policy, uh, you, have a, you have a very good code of ethics policy. You sign off on those. It's, it's important that you try to remind yourself. You also have a great norms and protocols, and they really fit together nicely. The, we see it as the code of ethics is the what and uh, what you have to do according to the state, and this somewhat tells you maybe how to think through and do it. Does that make sense? And they, they're not always, you know, everybody has different days and, and different moods and once in a while different experiences when, you, when you're talking to folks. But just remind yourself and glance at them once in a while and remember that they're living, breathing. Uh, if you can uh, do your part relative to that, other board members do, superintendent and the staff, 
then you have a great opportunity, a great opportunity to do, uh, you know, great things for your 30,000 kids. Okay, I'm going to turn it over now, we'll go to the facilities, and then I'll close out for that. That's good. So we are going to uh, have a couple of presentations, and we're going to start with our quarterly financial report. And so this is sort of the application of what we're talking about as far as sound financial policy. So I think Ms. Hall is going to come up. Um, and uh, take us into that. I will tell you that today is the trifecta we talk about once a year. We're going to touch on 21 audit. We're going to talk about the 22 briefly, uh, current year's budget, and also next year's proposed budget. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm bringing good news this morning regarding our the outcome of our FY21 financial audits. These documents I'm about to mention are available on our website, so the public public can access these as well as prior audits. We did get the notice this year that we will receive again, as we have the past several years uh, from the DOAA, the Excellent Financial Reporting Award. And as Mr. Barnett mentioned in prior in a prior board meeting, we did receive the ASBO <coughs> Award for our budget for FY21. So um, the first purpose of the independent auditor's report on our financial statements is do our financial statements comply with generally accepted accounting principles in the U.S.? And the opinion, as shown to the right, states that we do, uh, they do present fairly the position of the governmental activities in accordance with those standards. The second purpose is one that is um, a little more complicated, and it has to do with the actual components of our financial statements, and also our compliance with federal grant requirements. The results are to the right with the financial statements on top and uh, federal uh, awards compliance on the bottom. They're very similar as far as the results go, and that's a good thing. Both are unmodified with no material, uh, no internal control material weaknesses or significant uh, deficiencies identified. Uh, non-compli- no non-compliance was noted, no findings or question cost. And again, with the federal awards there at the bottom, you will see we are a low risk oddity. Honestly, you just couldn't get much better on both counts. So we're really proud of that work. And actually our last financial audit finding was 2006. So it's been 15 years, so let me knock on wood before I say that. We do strive for excellence, but I want to mention that if or when we ever did receive a financial finding, we would address it promptly and implement controls to prevent whatever weakness was identified. So um, just to mention SPLOST briefly, every year we have a performance audit on the SPLOST to make sure we comply with the expectations in the referendum voters approved, and also that we adhere to the law. And that is what our auditors found. In their opinion, we did comply in all material respects with the Georgia Constitution and the official code of Georgia, so good results there as well. And again, all of this information is on our website. So if there aren't any questions, I will shift to FY22 and the quarterly update for quarter ending March 31st, 2022. So um, first I wanna thank Morgan Bennett, who is in the 11th grade at Hiram High School for the great artwork. This uh, will be a permanent feature on this quarterly report and on our audited FY22 financial statements. So the quarterly report, which is posted on our website, is built around our major governmental fund types. This morning, Amber Thesma will present uh, general fund and special revenue highlights. Karen Mathis, the school nutrition director, will present school nutrition program highlights. Cole Crowder will present capital projects and debt service fund highlights. And Jennifer Gavant will provide a summary on allotments and vacancy. So we start this morning with general fund and special revenue. So I'll ask Amber Thesma to come up for that update. I've been a fixture up here this year. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I just wanted to touch on our uh, general fund budget for the quarter. 
Um, additional details uh, for the general fund can be found in our quarterly report starting on page five. Um, as of March, 75% of our budget year has elapsed. And looking at our revenue, we um, our percentage variance to budget is at 7.2%. And that's comparing to last year, which was at 5.5% at this time of the year. And um, from the chart, you see we're in line with our three-year average at 6.3%. Moving into our expenditures, um, we have spent 73% of the budget, and that is uh, trending very close to our prior year. Um, also looking at expenditures, our percentage variance to budget is 2%, which is in line with our prior year and our three-year average of 2.1%. And if you see our um, chart over to the left, this might look a little shocking, and I promise Mr. Barnett did not come running down to my office to find out what was going on. But um, this was a drop due to a one-time event of paying the one-time supplement um, to employees in March. Um, and actually, if uh, you notice, it kind of brings us back into uh, line with our prior year budget. I think this would be a budget that even Goldilocks would be proud of because we'd hit it just right. <laughs> um, our fund balance, we um, have equivalent to three months of expenditures. And um, again, this is kind of in line with last year where we were in March. And moving on to our special revenue funds, um, specifically our grants. We have 34 grant awards that are over um, $10,000 and that totals around $70 million. Our two largest areas uh, make up 70% of all of our grants. Our largest is QBE categorical grants at 48%. That um, includes our equalization. And our second largest is ESSER at 24%. Also, in our quarterly report, we report local school activity and school nutrition with our special um, revenue funds, and those start on page eight. Um, and speaking of our uh, school nutrition funds, we have asked Karen Mathis, our school nutrition director, to come and discuss um, some of her year-to-date quarterly results. Is there any questions for me? <laughs> I think so. Thank you, Amber. Has Mathis comes up. Just want to, you know, you saw what a great trend uh, we're looking like for this year. But also, you're going to hear over and over again, we're trying to get more and more discipline to drive to the quarterly report. That's a 50 page roughly document that has is required by board policy, it's required by Georgia law, or best practices. And so these are just highlights, but the real story is written in that quarterly report. And part of that story, one chapter is school nutrition. Good morning. Um, taking a look at school nutrition revenue, <clears throat> the first group of items on the bar graph are student sales, and that actually represents money paid by students and families. The discrepancy that you see there between budget and actuals is at the last minute the federal government decided that all students were eligible for, for free meals, and that was not budgeted. So if you look at the second grouping, you're going to see the dramatic ramp up of that represents federal revenue. So because students were eating free, most of the money came from the federal government at the free meal reimbursement rate and even at an enhanced free meal reimbursement rate than we actually planned for. Um, the reason for that was a lot of school nutrition programs actually um, went under the previous school year and so the federal government was trying to put, um, give them some extra assistance. So you'll see that represented in our total revenue being much greater than we originally anticipated. Um, the other revenue, we, um, it was greater than we actually thought because they provided additional assistance in some surprise unbudgeted and unexpected grants to the tune of about half a million dollars that we took advantage of. So I guess to su summarize, um, during the pandemic, we saw our revenues and our finances and our fund balance decline during the beginning of it, and then we were able to recover from that with um, a lot of federal assistance. So in looking at expenses, um, salaries and benefits are actually tracking a bit below budget, and that's because of just the difficulty in finding staff. Um, food purchases, of course, are above budget. Um, food costs, supply costs, many of our costs due to inflation, as you all well know, are much higher than expected. 
equipment is under. It is, has been very difficult during the pandemic to actually get equipment. We hope that improves um, next school year because we have increased our budget for that. But overall, our total, our total expenditures are tracking very, very close to budget. Any questions? Karen, do you want to talk a little bit about it? I know you're anticipating um, a larger than normal fund balance as a result of this year. And it, we're a little out of order, but can you talk a little bit to your FY23? I can. Um, normally, pre-pandemic, the school nutrition fund balance runs anywhere from um, high $5 million to $7 million. During the initial year of the pandemic, and some of you joined us at actually serving meals on the curb and um, paying staff that weren't working and a lot of challenges during the pandemic, our fund balance, actually our bank balance actually dropped to about $2.7 million. Our program never did go under, but um, it has built back up to our bank balance as highest that it's ever been in my tenure in 12 years to $10 million. So because of that, we do have some aggressive, aggressive plans for next year. Um, one of those, we plan to increase our salaries to assist us with recruitment and retention. That's been very difficult. We wanna take care of our staff so we can take care of our students. We've increased our large um, equipment purchase plans to almost a million dollars to reinvest in our infrastructure. Um, we do expect that the pandemic free meals will end at the end of this school year and parents um, free meal availability will go back to income based. And because of inflation um, and because of the strain on families, also with our high fund balance, we are not planning a meal price increase for next year. We do expect declining revenues. We do expect a declining fund balance, but we think that's in best interest of our students and families to proceed in that direction, at least for next year. So we're losing money on purpose. Yes, we are. That's a, I, I, if we're gonna lose money, we're gonna lose we money. A lot of it. <laughs> that would give me heartburn. We're, but, but it's on purpose. Um, we do expect food and supply cost increases to continue because of supply chain issues, fuel costs, and inflation, and that will contribute, contribute to those declining fund balance dollars. And we do expect our meal participation to decline due to the discontinuation of free meals. So do you have information, well, let me ask it this way, pre-pandemic, um, I know that um, the, the trends were declining participation um, and uh, the system put, put, was putting money into, I guess, making the, the whole meal process more peelable. And, and things like that. But mm -hmm. now that we're post pandemic, all those trends and things that were in place and that you were looking at before then, have they come back or is there new information to suggest that, that uh, those are just gonna pick up? And I know the, the whole um, ability for kids to all eat free, which is a good thing, probably skewed some of that information pre pandemic as well. So. I guess my question is, looking around the corner a little bit, how are those projections that, that and assumptions we were making before the pandemic, did those still hold true in terms of participation, um, cost, and all those things over the long term? Um, Pre-pandemic, because our district was 60% paid and about 40% free and reduced, we had um, a lot of students choosing to participate or buy items from us a la carte then rather than consuming meals. Right. So during the pandemic, of course, that shifted to consuming meals. We do expect that because the free meals will no longer be available for everyone, some shift back will occur. We don't know how much, but we do hope that since some of our students were able to enjoy the free meals and they actually tried our program and saw how good it was that they will continue making meal purchases. But we expect some of the swing to go back to a la carte. We do want to continue to invest in improving our cafeteria environments. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that will be coming back on the table. Which is my question. Mm -hmm. Do we have air conditioning in all of our We do. Yes, we do. That's complete. That has been completed. So is that a, so as you're thinking about it, are we talking about for the next, and it may be hard to say, are we talking about the next five years that's maybe the trend? Or are we talking 10 years? Because mm -hmm. if we we're talking know. about, and 
not trying to make it too complicated. If we're talking about a group of kids getting used to eating in the cafeteria, for lack of better words, in elementary school, and we plan on that bubble moving through our system and it continuing, um, are we doing what we need to do in terms of long-term investment? If that's the new trend for our population, because they, they're, they're, they've had a couple of years now where they've had free lunch. So are we investing the way we should long-term in people and equipment for that bubble that's gonna be moving through? Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. I had, a real, I had a real quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, on your chart, it shows that your, your purchases are over. Are you seeing shortages? Absolutely. Right and, a and lot. There again, you, you mentioned it earlier about the increased cost. How, how bad do you think it's going to get? <laughs> well, um, I budgeted an increase in food costs of 20% for next year. Thank you. That's it's just we hear it on the news every day and it's I, gonna get worse before it gets better while you're doing the presentation I thought it was gotta be in here too, so. yes it is did, did we take the opportunity while we had as many kids as we did participating in the free lunch program to measure the food waste from that program in other words how much was getting scraped off the plate into the trash and going out i, I mean did, i don't know if Anybody think to, to, to have an idea of how much of that food was being consumed versus how much? Uh, typically, when you give a lot of free things out, they take more maybe than they need. I, I, I think that that would make a uh, have an impact on how we plan for the bubble. Uh, and, and I don't know if we had any kind of um, analysis in place to figure out how much got consumed versus how much got scraped off into the trash. Um, we did not do a formal food waste study, if that's what you're asking, but one of the things that our district participates in is something called offer versus serve, and that's where a student for something to be counted as a reimbursable meal, they only have to take three of the five components. So they have flexibility. They don't have to take everything, and okay, we don't so force them. so we didn't them. just load it up and say, no, we did here's not. your meal, you have to take it. No, we did not. Okay, that was a lot more responsible way to do it. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mathis. With that, I'll we'll ask uh, Mr. Crowder to come up and touch on uh, capital projects and debt service. Good morning. I think it's still morning. I know we're, uh, my notes say morning, sorry. But uh, so yeah, next I'd like to highlight uh, from our quarterly, like Steve was mentioning, these are just the highlights, but um, go over capital projects and debt service funds. Um, on the screen here, you will see this is a summary of SPLOS 6 and uh, our SPLOS 6 bond funds. Um, first, we've got collections in SPLOS 6 of $24.7 uh, million. We've, got, uh, we've paid debt service of $5.4 million. We've, got, um, we've completed capital project work totaling $11 million. And I think I might have missed it, but um, the first bullet was supposed to uh, circle that we were trending 29.3% ahead of our projected collections. Um, another note from the quarterly is on SPLOS 5, and that, of course, as you know, ended April 2021, and it currently has a fund balance of $12.1 million, and it will be used for future capital projects. Um, as of March 31st, our debt service fund has outstanding bond debt of $77 million in our 2014 and 2022 series, which will fully mature in 2023. And then we also have $26 million of outstanding 2020 series debt with a full maturity date of August 2026. It's kind of a tongue full when you put it all together. But um, just lastly, I want to mention, like Steve did again, that in our quarterly, we have supplemental reports um, in the appendix, and those include information on allotments, enrollment, encumbrances, purchasing, budgets, grants, and donations. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Crowder. Mm -hmm. And as Ms. Gavant comes up, I'll just mention real fast that, uh, um, uh, that again, uh, if, if just driving the, the folks to... Uh, uh, to that report in that you will see that one of the ways we're funding some of these capital projects you're going to hear more about later 
is the fact this board is open to re refunding our debt twice. And the total savings for that is going to be around $12 million. And that's $12 million we would not have had had we not been willing to act and the board wasn't willing to act when the time was right. So I just want to thought I'd mention that. Let's go on. Thank you. Uh, and I know it's still morning for me because the call didn't take that long. Um, just a, a recap, um, third quarter allotments and vacancies. We're still at our 3,799 current allotments. Brings us to almost 194 total vacancies as we wrap up third quarter, and that's as of March 31st. Primarily, those are non-school based with our main three that we've seen consistently this year in transportation, um, maintenance, school nutrition. Notably, school nutrition's actually reduced their vacancy percentage since second quarter um, tremendously, while we did see maintenance and transportation with a little bit of an uptick. I did want to mention when we look at trends from last year, we're on track, although our percentage is a little bit higher uh, this year than last year, we are trending in the same way to where we would expect to see that higher percentage in third and fourth quarter as we close out our hiring year in FY22 and look at starting our hiring year for FY23. So the numbers, while they're not what we would like to see, they're not abnormal for this time of year. Ms. Vaughn. We're going to shift uh, quickly to a budget update presentation. This really won't take but a few minutes. Uh, Abby Dye is going to come forward. Really, we've covered virtually everything you can imagine, obviously, in the last several meetings, many meetings on the budget. One piece we wanted to focus in on today just briefly was grants, as it is a significant, significant part of our overall budget right now. Good morning. As Mr. Barnett mentioned, if you look at our budget roadmap, you can see we presented revenue, allotments, general fund expenditures, and the tentative budget. Today, I'm going to highlight the special revenue funds. In the tentative budget, we presented $1.6 million in general fund grants, which includes state-funded grants. As you can see from the chart, the $1.6 million is divided into four main portions. You see ESEP is at 673000 CTAE is 452000 People Transportation at 192000 and Math and Science Supplement at 172. Looking back at our tentative budget, we have allocated $33 million for federal grants for FY23. Of that $33 million, Esther is making up 55% of that amount with $18.2 million, followed by ESEPT and title grants with $5.6 million and $4.5 million. Lastly, L4GA is budgeted at $3.9 million. I did want to mention that we have allocated $1.8 million in indirect cost reimbursement. As you know, Board Policy DFK requires grants valued at $50,000 or more to be approved in advance by the Board. On the slide, we have the list of all of those are grants. The total 34 is the 1.6 million in state and 33 million in federal that we just went over. Getting to the fun part, ESSER grants. For the ESSER grants, we have ESSER 1, which is complete with 3 million spent. ESSER 2 is projected to finish in FY22 with 12.6 million, and we've budgeted 15 million for ESSER 3 and FY23. On our website, we have further information on the ESSER grants, including our ESSER spending worksheet. We update that quarterly, and that worksheet shows the various initiatives that ESSER funds are being used for. We look back at our roadmap. Our next step in the budget process is on June 14th. We'll present the original budget presentation and request the board to adopt the budget. I know that was fast, but are there any yeah, questions? No. Thank you, Ms. Dye. I will mention on the, uh, the ESSER form that you saw there, you couldn't read it probably because the text is too small. Yep. But I will tell you that ESSER 3, and correct me if I'm wrong, has a requirement that 20% has to be spent directly on, on, uh, on resolving learning loss. Yes. I went back and, and you know, there's a, you know, obviously you can debate what, what qualifies, but a safe number for us, not only for 3, but also for 2, is more like 80%. And that's where we spent all of our money, essentially, other than some, some safety measures right. and, and some payroll you know, things related to that. So you may hear on the news there's been some chatter about districts and questioning the cost or how they spent their ESSER money. 
Um, we didn't even go into that world. We, we stayed focused on, on, on the students. So I just, I thought I'd mention that. And, and also that our budget feedback portal is still open. Part if folks want to make, uh, you want to leave feedback or suggestions, so. Yes, technology, mm -hmm. SR1, we spent all on technology mm -hmm. for the students and the teachers. So. Well, thank you, Ms. Dye. So that hopefully is an example of uh, the performance objective of sustaining uh, uh, excellent financial stewardship. And, and Tony, as you come back up, I'll ask you, do you know the school district that has not had a finding in 15 years? It's amazing. <laughs> it really is. I, I, I'm glad you're an independent, uh, no, objective that's person. That's amazing. I've been saying it. It is. We need to investigate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. Kidding. That's a good point. Kidding. <laughs> We're not. That's that. tremendous. It really is. <laughs> And um, uh, this hall, we have to check into that. That's a finding of a finding, yeah. Well, not a finding, yeah. No, I th and uh, I, I know, um, I think when they rate, there's very few districts that got this high a score, right? When they've done audits and everything. Even uh, in 16, when we were starting that first strategic plan where we're really involved, that came out and a lot of that was a really nice piece for a lot of the citizens to hear because they're, they're not following that kind of stuff, but that's tremendous. That really is, that takes, that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of integrity. And that's, that says a lot, it really does. So I'm gonna close by, first of all, keep up the great work you're doing. Uh, it's a pleasure. I know the strategic planning folks. Uh, we love working with you any way you can. You're, you're continuing to get bigger and better. That's hard to do. And just continue to do the great work. Uh, you're an exemplary board. We're very glad you're an exemplary board. Your board norms and your code of ethics are just important things to just keep, keep, keep your eye on and just remind you once in a while of uh, best practices. Uh, and we demonstrated and talked about many starting with the strategic plan today. I'm gonna leave you with this. It's very, very important what you say and how people take what you say. And nowadays with the politically charged uh, environment we have and, and uh, emotional stuff, many of us went through for a couple of years with COVID. Uh, it's more important than ever, I think, than to uh, be careful what you say. And it's not always what you say, but how you say it. I'm gonna share a very short video. It doesn't last three minutes. And it, it sends a powerful message on that. And it's interesting because it's about words and there's very, very little dialogue only at the end. So, uh, it's Taylor. Same. I wrote the same, but in different words. Thanks, love. Yeah, we uh, 
we, we date back to our day, my day is back in Cobb. So I really appreciate the work you've done with us uh, over the last you know, few weeks getting ready for this and value your wisdom um, in this process. So Mr. Chairman, with that, we'll keep going. We're moving on to session four now. Things will speed up a little bit. Uh, so in session four, we have uh, Dr. Browning, who's gonna come up. And, uh, and this is a, a, an example really, and, and you could say this about a lot of things, but this topic, facilities and what we're planning on touches every one of those domains in some way or another, uh, some form or fashion. So Dr. Browning's gonna talk about that. And uh, Mr. Wicks is gonna come up also and join in the fun and uh, as our director of capital improvement. So the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm not feeling any pressure at all by the um, timetable that I now have <laughs> and or that uh, Dr. Gergata said earlier that we were the most popular topic, you know, at the strategic planning session. But uh, good morning. It's, it's great to be here to share with you and to, re um, to kind of refer you back to that. Um, as Jason shared with you earlier, facility services has a performance objective in the goal areas of operational organizational excellence, which is to meet the needs of our growing and aging facilities. There are three initiatives that we are going to be working on within this area, and that's to complete our master facility planning process, um, to really um, continue the work that is going on in our renovation and modification cycle, and that also includes ma maintenance cycle projects as well. And then the new construction projects that we talked with you guys about about a month ago, I guess it was. So our goal for today is really to kind of hone in around this concept of master facility planning, renovating and modif uh, modification of the buildings and lead into what you're gonna see later on your agenda or in about 15 seconds, if I can talk fast enough, <laughs> on your agenda. And that's our five-year facility planning process because you are an important part of kicking off that process and then approving our five-year facility plan. So we're, we're gonna try to just give you a little bit of context today to lead you into what is your role in the master facility planning with our five-year plan. So there are several facets to master facility planning, and it all starts with a foundation. And the foundation of that master facility plan is what are your design specifications and what are your educational specifications. You probably understand design specs or, you know, that workmanship, materials, processes that go into building. Educational specs, those of us who are um, at heart teachers, are important though because they talk about the educational philosophy, uh, the programs, the goals that we have for our instructional spaces, and how that translates into facility design. And this really guides how do we make sure that we're equitable from north to south, from east to west, and that everybody has those same facilities to meet the needs of our kiddos. Another asset aspect of master facility planning is facility age. And Jason shared this slide with you guys about three weeks ago or four weeks ago when we talked about our, our capacity um, process. And so master facility planning is driven by the age of our facilities. Um, but we don't just look at the core structure and when it was built. We also look at any additions or modifications that have happened to that building. So I'm gonna give you an example. It's not listed up here because we do support a lot of facilities that are not included in these 33 and they don't earn capital funding. One of those is New Hope Education Center. So New Hope Education Center, which was the old Abney Elementary, was built in 1954. But it was remodeled and added onto in 1973. And then it got a new wing in 1980. And then again in 1991. And then that 1991 portion was then remodeled again in 2019 when it became PCCA. So buildings go through a lot of change over time. So you don't just look at what is that core structure time frame of 1954, but how has that building changed over time and how do we react to that? Another facet is the operational capacity. So again, I stole all my slides from Jason. He makes the best ones. So um, capacity at a school does impact facility planning, especially when we go into thinking about school mitigations. Do we need to add a new office? Do we need to add another small classroom? Do we need to change from a computer lab back to a home room because now we need an additional kindergarten class and can't house a computer lab? So a lot of that goes into our master facility planning as well. But really, master facility planning is all around this 
five-year facility plan process. And our intention, our, our internal master facility planning process kind of informs what is required by state law. And that is that you update and um, submit every five years to be eligible to participate in the Georgia's capital outlay program, a master facility plan or a five-year facility plan. We do partner with area consultants and Georgia DOE staff directly to do this process. And you're gonna see that resolution later in the um, board agenda. And it's really to kind of develop a system-wide list of projects or priorities for us. And that's why we get those consultants to come in and help us with that process. Um, the, this priority list kind of determines what is our regular entitlement from the state, which is the school system's annual share of the state's capital cap, annual capital outlay. That master facility planning process really kind of determines when do we go into a facility and do renovations and modifications to a, to a building. The cycle begins after the first 10 years of occupancy when each facility begins to earn up to $14,000 per IU. We then make an application after 20 or more years to utilize those specifically around HVAC, roofing, uh, kitchen modifications, and the application to the DOA starts with reimbursement applications and then also our intentions to use local fair shares. We've been completing renovations and modification projects throughout SPLOS 5. We have a future projects with SPLOS 6, and I'm going to ask Mr. Wicks to come up with you and share with you some of the specific projects that we have going on. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I get the distinct privilege of being able to come and present to you the fun things. And so when I say fun things, from someone that has been in some form of construction for well over 20 years, and to go back to my southern vernacular, being carrying a two by four since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Um, it is an honor and privilege to be able to take that and put it inside of our school system and to be able to put it into the facilities that we have so that we can give these students wonderful facilities so that they have the best educational environment that they have. So on your screen here, you will actually see in Splash 5, and SPLOSH 6, these are some of the projects that have been completed that are either in progress or that are up and coming. So going into the completed projects, you have East Paulding High School, and it kind of give you a little bit of an idea of how we work through those. These are usually typical summer projects. However, there's work that is done throughout the year through scheduled breaks and time periods. And we also overlap those. So for example, depending on the scope of work that needs to go into the school, usually depending on the severity of the need of the facility or the size of the facility, for example, East Paulding High School, East Baldwin High School is a large campus. We had to separate it out over a two-phase process. So we started summer of 2017, finished in summer of 2018. But in summer of 2018, we also started East Paulding Middle School. We're able to complete that campus in its entirety. We started the two-phase project of uh, Herschel Jones. Herschel Jones isn't as big as East Paulding High School, so some people may say, well, why did you separate that one? The reason is because of the age of facility and the need. At Herschel Jones, we have to go in and look at infrastructure aspects like the removal of galvanized plumbing that was inside of the walls, inside of chase walls. We didn't have to do that at East Paulding High School. So because of the severity and because of the scope, we separate those projects out. So again, going into that, we were all we took into uh, Panner and Nebo in 2019, summer of 2019. 2020, the summer of that, we had a little bit of a skip on there because we focused on the additions that we started at Moses and at Russell. And now we're going into uh, Hiram, started first phase last year. We will finish up Hiram this year and we will do Dobbins and All Good summer of this year as well. So renovations, modifications, we focus a lot on what we call in the, in the uh, industry, the MEP. Mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Those are your basic infrastructures. A lot of times those infrastructures are things that you don't get to see a lot of, but they are vital in what we do and, and to the environment that is provided to the kids. And inside of that electrical is low voltage systems, code compliance upgrades, uh, you're getting new intercoms, you're getting new fire alarms. We also look at, as Dr. Browning explained, the roofing and the flooring and the painting and just those things that each facility needs. And as we go in, 
we again take into consideration what each one of these uh, facilities needs so that we can build that into the scope so that we can get the most robust scope and we can best use those financial dollars that we have to get the best bang for the dollar so as we go into again we've talked about in progress upcoming we are doing conceptual designs of roberts elementary moses middle school Baggett elementary pool austin and hiram and each one of those is going to have different aspects and different facets that we're going to look at uh, again you'll see later that uh, roberts elementary you know we've got a potential you know conceptual design for other future projects out there trying to figure out how we can incorporate a uh, renovation inside of that at the same time so again we can go into the next slide the next slide talks about other items that are inside of our current splashed and so these are items that were specified as, as needs inside of the district. We have our fire alarms and intercom upgrades. And again, that is trying to get to that equitability that uh, Dr. Browning was talking about, getting that functionality at all of our facilities, taking out some of those aging systems that either are antiquated, we no longer have the ability to maintain and repair because honestly, there's no longer parts. We have done, in my uh, personal opinion, a, fant a fantastic job of being able to maintain systems beyond almost their relative lifespans. And this is an opportunity for us to be able to get those systems uh, replaced. Safety and security enhancements, uh, theaters and fine arts. And I think theaters and fine arts is an opportunity to talk a little bit about the ed specs and the design specs that Dr. Browning just spoke about earlier. You go into a theater and you say, okay, what's the biggest and the best? Well, we can get you a price on the biggest and the best. But the question is, for the curriculum, for what they are actually doing and the students using inside of that, what do they need? So the educational specifications help us define what is needed. The design specifications make sure that what we provide meets that educational need. So we go into those conceptual designs and we go through the process of looking at all of that and involving and doing a collaborative effort of being able to involve our administration, involve the teaching staff, involve those uh, that are content experts inside of those areas. So moving on, athletic facility enhancements. Most every one of you have probably visited a campus uh, because if you visited any of our five high schools, there has been a project that has been done to enhance the uh, athletic uh, areas. Uh, you've got some scoreboards that have been done at the vast majority of them or weight room modifications. <laughs> so we are still in the process of completing some of those projects. We have some that are currently underway and we also have some additional that are still in conceptual design and that we are trying to get again the best bang out of the dollar. But every high school has been touched at some point in time to be able to, uh, to benefit off of that. Now we go into the last one, engineering labs at the middle schools in South Paulding High School. We have an upcoming project you'll hear a little bit uh, later today uh, about the South Paulding High School, but also our middle school engineering labs. Those are your family consumer science to STEM lab initiatives. We have already started the process. We've already completed Scoggins and East Paulding Middle School. We are working on Dobbins, South Paulding, and Herschel Jones now. And then we will be moving into the remainder of McClure, PB Rich, Austin, and Moses, uh, respectively, as we go. Now, last slide we have. Now, this one is one of those that I'm really excited about because as the former maintenance director, I'm very excited about the fact that we are, we are getting to a point where we're able to put money specifically inside of our budget to address some things that we have noticed and we have seen over the course of time that needed to be. And these are those projects that have had historically been deemed a local school expense. So you get into an elementary school playground, which you see on the bottom side, lighting upgrades for some of your athletic and sports lightings. You get into your asphalt repairs and resurfacings. We are starting to put um, these things inside of our master facilities plans and putting them on a cycle. So that way, for example, if you go into an elementary school and you have a drum sanding of your gymnasium floor, well, if it is recommended that a drum sanding is happens every 10 years, we have 19 facilities, we put that on a cycle so that way we can get that 10 year cycle out of those drum sandings. But it also inside of that facilities plan, we are building in sustainability so that way we can continue those cycles moving forward. So that way we make sure that every one of our facilities is getting again that equitability across uh, what we can provide as a district. So again, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. I will give it back over to Dr. Browning. 
Had we not tried to go as fast, I do want to say that we would have met the number of jokes that you heard out of business services today. They were by far uh, the funniest presentation. And um, if you've sat through prior budget presentations, I don't want to say that you know they weren't funny, but these guys were super funny today. Um, but we do want to make sure we're always communicating with you and sharing with you what is going on in facility services. We're excited about all of the upcoming projects. We're excited that um, we're able to provide these services to our, our kids and our, our teachers and to our schools. Um, so we're going to make sure we're updating you uh, regularly. You're going to see in your weekly updates in your newsletters a little blurb about some of the projects that we're completing and or that we, the work that we completed that week. You're going to see agenda items like today where there's um, contracts for approval that you'll see on your agenda items. In our quarterly updates we will that Jason talked about earlier with our strategic plan, we'll do quarterly updates as well to inform you about where we are with budget and project completion. And then of course, we're gonna have some special events coming up. We're gonna have a groundbreaking here in September because uh, we're going to be breaking ground to build a new school. If you go out Seven Hills Boulevard, you're gonna see a sign posted on that, sh that road here in the next couple of days. And we're kicking off that project and super excited about that. We're gonna have some grand openings where these renovations will be grand reopenings of schools. And we will of course invite you out to see what the work looks like on the back end as what you got to see on the front end with our first facility tour. And we'll continue our facility tours into FY23, hopefully getting two tours in this year um, as we uh, make our way around to inspect our facilities. So with that, we conclude our portion of the presentation. I think two Southerners talked pretty good and well and fast. And uh, if you have questions. Yes. Uh, all the projects look real good. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff. It seems like splosh is used for renovations and mods primarily, or even though we do have a middle school in it. When are we going to see something with the Union, New Georgia, Herschel Jones, and Dallas Elementary in, yeah. in a five-year plan? Yeah, so you're going to see what we have um, in a, our project proposal or our project planning is we're kind of looking at quadrants or three little tiers. Uh, we're addressing with our capital dollars, which includes BLOST, as well as our own local fair share, as well as um, bond dollars and things like that. New projects that are happening in that, that first tier to address overcrowding. Um, you're seeing renovations that are happening here in our middle tier with some strategic additions. And then we are going to be addressing um, our third tier or our southern um, list of schools with um, what might be um, considered aging facilities and how we uh, deal with those. So uh, you're going to be seeing that here in the next uh, five-year facility plan. Unless there's any more questions, we will move on. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wicks. Uh, great job. I will tell you the number one priority as Cole Crowder comes up, we're going to go through some procurement items. I'll tell you the number one priority we said that we started talking about what we're about to do is we got to take care of what we already own. We can't let new projects, additions, cannibalize uh, and affect the, all the other schools that are out there that need attention as well. So I'm glad that's, that, that remains the focus. Mr. Crowder, would you like to take us through the procurement items that will appear as consent agenda items? on the 14th of June. Sure. First, I have four renewals that I will try to get through here. Uh, the first one is our renewal of request for proposal for WAN and internet service. It was originally awarded to Comcast Business in November of 2020 for the five-year period beginning in July 2021. This recommendation will allow us to continue with our contract through June 30th, 2023. The next one is renewal of request for proposal for network equipment originally awarded to PC Solutions and Integration LLC for a one year term beginning in July of 2021. This renewal will be the first of five one year optional renewals. The next one is renewal of invitation to bid for natural gas originally awarded to Gas South LLC with an initial term beginning in October of 2019. This term will be the third of four one-year options of renewal. Our next is renewal of invitation to bid for pest control, originally awarded to Jack's Pest Control Services for the initial term beginning October 1st of 2019.
This is the third of four one-year options to renew. And then I have one recommendation, and that is request for proposal for a construction manager at risk for the engineering lab at South Paulding High School. Uh, this uh, RFP was issued on April 1st, 2022 and posted to the district website, PCSD's bonfire solicitation portal, the Georgia Procurement Registry, and also in the district lobby. One response to this bid was received by the Procurement Department on or before the deadline of May 2nd, 2022. PCSD's Evaluation Committee has selected RK Reading Construction after their review and based upon the evaluation criteria. I'll pause there, but if there's no questions, I'll move on. So lastly, I have three architectural contracts to present to you, and I'll just quickly go through those. The first is Seven Hills Projects with Bro and Associates. The next is the Burnt Hickory Elementary Edition with Bro and Associates. And the third is the North Paulding High School Edition with CGLS Architects. Uh, just one thing to mention, our educational architects are an exempt professional service, but due to the scope of these projects, they're being presented to you today. All right. Some big dollars on architects here. <laughs> This is uh, what I asked uh, Mr. Barnett to send everybody in the email so you guys would have an opportunity to review those in depth because they were such large contracts. And if the, um, the second architect is a little unfamiliar to you, uh, they have done work for us before. I believe three facilities uh, that they've, they've worked on before for us. But uh, any other questions though from Mr. Crowder? Uh, well, then uh, we'll move on. Thank you, Mr. Crowder. Ms. Browning, if you would talk a little bit about the resolution uh, that will be on the action agenda. So our current five-year plan is set to expire this upcoming June of 2023. So today starts the process for what is that five-year planning process for addressing our facilities in the next five years. That plan will um, span the scope of <laughs> July 2023 to June 2028. This resolution officially asks the Georgia DOE Facilities Department to assist us as we develop our plan. And our goal is to present by uh, mid-year next year our plan for approval. And we are set to start um, then that work in next July then. So with that, we ask share this resolution with you. Thank you, unless there's any questions. We will move on to Ms. Mathis, who has three procurement items related to school nutrition. The first procurement item related to school nutrition is for paper products. Um, this was a new award last, or for this school year to Tanner Grocery out of Carrollton, and we are asking for a renewal of this. This would be the first of a maximum of four renewals of this award. The second item is the food safety and sanitation <clears throat> solicitation. This is, also, this is a new solicitation for this year. We um, invited eight companies to participate and respond, and only one responded um, at an annual proposed price of $63,525. This is our current vendor, and um, so we are asking that since they were the only responsive and responsible vendor that they be um, awarded this contract. The third item is the milk, juice, and dairy RFP. Um, this one's a little bit different. Paulding County School Nutrition participates in a purchasing group called the Georgia Education Cooperative, and that's a large group of school systems of about 42 that are north of I-20. And Paulding County actually um, administers this bid for the entire group of school systems. Um, this award is with Mayfield Dairy. We are asking for a renewal, and this would be the final renewal of this contract with Mayfield Dairy. I'm glad Ms. Mathis mentioned that's 37, if you see that on the detail, 37, 37 systems. participating. Uh, so 36 are relying on, on our folks to, to get that yes. right. It's a, it's a, it's a huge big, big it responsibility. Us, gives us pretty significant buying power. Too. It gives yeah. us huge buying power because there, there's been a lot of tumultuous things going on in the milk market this year. A lot of systems lost their vendor this year in South Georgia. And because of us being in this large group, we had quite a bit of clout. 
Thank you, Ms. Mathis. Thank Unless you. there's any additional questions. Uh, a couple more items to mention. Uh, before I do that, I will say that all this information, all the information for all these items are, are attached to the agenda, the backup information, financial impact, and all. And our, our goal is to, to put all this on the consent agenda again for the 14th. And a couple more items that will be on that consent agenda are uh, a request that the board approve. Again, Ms. Dye mentioned this earlier, board policy DFK, which requires us to bring to the board any grant that's more than 50000 this is outside the scope of the budget. It's over 50,000, so we're bringing it to the board for their approval. It's $192,000 alternative fuel award by the Georgia Board of Education. I will tell you that alternative fuel is propane. Uh, it's not electricity. Not electricity <laughs> at this point. Who knows, one day. But uh, right now, this is just about propane. Uh, not not that there's anything wrong with electricity, but yeah. I think we all had a little bit of a heart failure when, yeah, when, right. when we had the last electric bus proposal come through. So. Elon Musk will get to us at some point, uh, and we'll, we'll wind up doing it eventually. But the uh, last item is asset disposal list for June, and you've got the list again there. It's attached to the agenda. Uh, of course, we're available to answer any questions between now and the 14th, but you'll see roughly 290 items on that, uh, on that report. I just wanted to go back to the alternative fuel thing. That was, I don't know if you guys remember, Mr. Studd still gave us a presentation in the last meeting that we're retrofitting a lot more of our buses and we're continuing to do that because the propane fuel was much cheaper than the diesel fuel that we are working with. So that's actually a twofold thing. It's both a grant and it's going to save us money in the long run to operate those buses. Deal. Those 14 items, again, will be on a consent uh, agenda and also, uh, I'm sorry, and I'll move on from there, is a point of information on the agenda regarding uh, field trips. So you'll see a couple of items there um, for out-of-state charter or overnight field trips. Our, uh, um, golf teams already. happened already because of the urgency, which is actually a good thing because it means they're in a tournament. Uh, so that's, we're proud of them for that. Uh, even if it doesn't work with our schedule for our board meetings, <laughs> we're still proud of them to, to do that. So uh, moving on to superintendent's report, I'm just going to mention a couple of things. COVID-19, the task force continues to do their work. We're now in the low double digits uh, for COVID-19 <coughs> cases, and we continue at the green operating level. Just going to mention literally a couple of things, and that is uh, to just say thank you for all those that were involved in Yes, I Can. Um, uh, our award winners, uh, their families, they certainly lived up to the theme this year of uh, We Are Champions. So uh, I just want to especially thank our student services department for coordinating the event, Hiram High School for hosting the event, our volunteers and sponsors for helping make the event so special for our ESEP students. And if you ever have a chance to go to a Yes I Can Awards next year, and uh, I will push hard for, for you guys to attend because it is uh, something special to behold. So uh, but anyway, I want to also remind everyone May is Teacher Appreciation Month in Georgia, so it's a good opportunity to thank teachers in your life for the extraordinary work they do every day, but especially over the last few years. I want to congratulate all of our graduating seniors. We look forward to celebrating you and the collective accomplishments of your class Friday night at East Pauling, uh, North Pauling and South Pauling High Schools and Saturday morning at Hiram and Pauling County High Schools. Uh, and again, just want to say pulling off a ceremony of this magnitude is no small feat, especially when you do it five times. So thank you to the school administration, local and district staff, Pauling County Sheriff's Office and everyone that's going to make this weekend ultimately possible. And uh, our next board meeting will be on June 14th, starts at 5 p.m. with an executive session, and then we'll move into our public portion after that, starting at around 6.30. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. All right. That was quick, and I appreciate everybody that uh, gave us presentations for keeping yourself on track. That, that's a record. We're <laughs> only five minutes past, and you guys gave us a lot of information today, so thank you. Um, at this point, we will uh, move on to board member comments. Um, being this election day, I'll start with Mr. Dean and uh, let him work his way down to Mr. Chester. I want to thank everyone that came out and gave these. Like Mr. Nolan said, we've had tons of information today. It'll probably take us all afternoon at least to read most of the stock. Um, I'm just looking forward to finishing <laughs> up our strategic plan and getting that in place because that's going to be the foundation that we work off of as a, as a team for the next five years. So thank all of you for the hard work you've done. I just want to say thank you to GSBA and all of you guys for all the hard work and dedication, getting everything done as far as the budget, the strategic plan. I know there's a lot of very time weighty, you know, things, and you've all done a great job with that. Um, I just want to say congrats to all of our graduating seniors and to everybody else. Hope you enjoy your summer and come back next year ready to learn and keep moving forward. And 
And uh, I just want to reiterate, thank you to the GSBA, Mr. Rossi, and your team for being here today. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, just want to say uh, real quick, I'm looking forward to the graduation ceremonies uh, this weekend. And congrats to all the graduates. So what I want to say is, is to the folks in this room, what we started out with in the beginning of the year and where we're at right now, don't look anything. One doesn't look anything like the other. You guys have done a spectacular job of taking the, uh, uh, the changes that are coming your way. A lot of you guys have been promoted, uh, didn't even probably realize at the beginning of the year that that would happen. Uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to working with the team we have in place over the next two to five years. Uh, and I really appreciate the fact that you guys spend the time that you do to give us the information that you've given us so that we can make good decisions for the children of Paulding County School District. And it is evident in your presentations and your work ethic uh, to this board that you guys are putting in a uh, effort to do the right thing. So I just want to thank all of y'all. Um, the graduates uh, this weekend, we've got uh, uh, this, this graduating class has seen some serious adversity over the last uh, over their high school career, um, uh, how we've gotten uh, through the process and to where we are now um, with, a, uh, with the success that we've had given uh, the relative, uh, relatively to other school districts around the country, uh, I, I'm proud to be on this board. I'm proud to represent the school district and I'm proud of the people who, who work here, uh, all 30 some odd hundred of you. Uh, have come here and, and, and done exactly what our mission statement is, uh, which is to engage, inspire, and prepare. So I just want to say thank you for that. Uh, Y'all are going to laugh because every time we meet, we start at the end, and I have thoughts in my head of what I'm going to say. And somebody <laughs> says it, and I'm going, okay. And I reword it, and somebody's going to say it, and I reword it. By the time it gets to me, he has already said everything I have reworded. Um, I was going to say how proud I am to be a part of the Paulding County Board of Education, this board, and these people. Um, you guys have worked very, very hard. I was excited as a new board member to have the opportunity to serve on that strategic planning committee. Um, I've learned so very much. You talked about how different as a candidate wanting to become a board member and then actually sitting in the seat um, to have the students, the teachers, the parents, um, all of the administrators to participate in that was an exciting experience for me. Um, I feel like I have a tiny little part in that five-year plan. Uh, even though I am a board member, I still feel like I have a tiny part in that strategic plan, that five-year plan that we have in front of us, and I am excited and very proud. I did want to say congratulations, like we all do, to the graduates. Um, and then just, you guys have a great summer. I'm looking forward to all the work that we're going to be doing behind the scenes, that Central Office will be doing behind the scenes during the summer to get ready for a great next year. Thank you. What did you do to deserve you being here today? <laughs> we really appreciate you coming. Um, but what I want to do is add to what Mr. Nolan said. He said where we were and where we are, and I want to say where are we going to be next year this time? What are we going to look back and say, wow, we did that right? And I think with the exponential growth that we have in Pauling County, we're going to have to have exponential creativity and, you know, and expand our virtual reality. and, and to miss, we've got some brilliant minds here that can figure out how to do it. But I think, um, you know, the virtual reality school has got to have the same um, accountability as far as truancy and things like that. And like Mr. Barnett said, it's an honor to be in that program. And if you're not participating according to what our criteria is, then you no longer have that privilege. But I also have an idea that I think what's, might be worth thinking about it's kind of a hybrid um, virtual reality, but that we can talk about that later. But also the possibility of having teachers that are virtual teachers teach from their home and give them some type of compensation 
for the room that they're using. They can turn a whole office room or space into their classroom, and that will free up classrooms in the buildings. So if we can, th I just want to throw those thoughts out there because we have to have come up with creative things. And I know, Susan Brandon, you, your wheels are turning already. But, you know, like I said, that's where we were. This is where we are, where we're going to be. And um, I think virtual, the way that we have virtual, virtual reality in place, we had it in place when COVID hit. We had the smoothest transition in the country. We were able to flip a switch, and all of a sudden, we had no, no lost school days. So we have a tremendous um, leadership team that is, is way before. We're always right before the crunch, and we are able to deal with it and with the technology. So um, I think it might be some things to think about in the future is, you know, letting these teachers work from home and compensate them for that free up our classrooms for our growth. So I think that just kind of sums up all of my, my thoughts for right now. You have the floor. Um, I just want to say congratulations to all the seniors, to the mm -hmm. parents, to the community. Every time we have a, a crop of kids matriculating <laughs> through, it is a feather in our hat and I'm super proud of it. My own son's graduating tomorrow. It's been such a long, long, <laughs> long, 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 long journey. And so um, looking forward to that, looking forward to having a happy, safe s summer and just, um, you know, and, and enjoying that time. But uh, be safe, everyone. Take care of themselves and enjoy your summer. And uh, let's have a, a couple of great graduations this this upcoming holiday weekend and just thankful for the community. Thank you. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn to executive session. Moved. First by Ms. Collette. Second. Second by Mr. Dean. Any discussion? Uh, yeah, I've got an amendment. Um, I would like to make an amendment to that to amend the agenda to remove executive session today unless the superintendent feels the need to go there. Um, I don't believe there's any legal. Everyone was emailed the personnel report and the discipline report. So unless there's anything specific that he needs to go over with us, um, I would make a motion that we amend the agenda and not go into executive session or suspend executive session for today's meeting. All right, so how do I handle that, Paul? That's you a would motion. need a second. Need second. second. I would second. need a second. I'll be on the amendment. Second on it. Anybody want to second that? Oh, sorry? Oh, I was going to second oh, I, I Okay. It. So second by Ms. Lyons. Any discussion on that? Well, actually, let's back up. Are we suspending it or we're we just going to remove it from no, this agenda? Re remove it from today totally and still just go right into the exec the uh, action agenda. Yeah, I'm seconding it. Okay, hold on one second. So just as a point of order, Mr. Cable, we do have a uh, personnel report and a short-term suspension report that we have to approve or you you can vote on those if, if that's up to the superintendent if he thinks that there's is there anything in, to be voted on in, the, in those two things that we need to deal with today not the board hadn't already seen well i mean the board seen we need to understand, understand nothing it but, today nothing yeah. and okay. you can vote on them without going into executive session so if you if you feel the need if the board members so, feel the need to discuss it then they go so does the anybody have any issue with going ahead and approve the personnel report we could do the we can do the tribunal or, or short-term suspension report later, but does anybody have any issue as we're discussing this approving the personnel agenda? I don't. I don't have any issues with either of those two items going ahead and being voted on, unless there's a board member or the superintendent feels the need that we need to discuss one of those items back there. You but if we do not, them. then we can go ahead right. and vote on them today. So what do I? Uh, how do, how, so you have an amendment that's been seconded. So you need to first vote on that amendment, which but amends the agenda, the amendment. and then you'd vote on the agenda as amended. So you have two votes. All right. So. We're gonna we're gonna vote on on the amendment. Make uh, Mr. Dean, you have some discussion. No, I've got a question. Is there anything else besides the personnel and the tribunal and stuff that we need to cover? Well, we got to approve our minutes, but everybody can do that. Yeah, you have to, you, you, yeah, you have to vote yeah, on your I mean, executive session minutes do we have at the next executive session. So if you don't go into executive session this time, you'd have to do that at the at the next meeting. Everything else you could vote on. You could vote on personnel without yeah. discussing it. You could vote on the short-term suspension without discussing it. You could vote on the tribunal without My discussing it. My question is, is there anything important that we need to go back to executive session with the superintendent? Be more of a superintendent. Not, from my, not okay. from my perspective. Okay, so um, we, we have a, an amendment to vote on. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. Okay, 
Then you'd vote on the now we need to as amended. Uh, okay, so now we need to. Um, it, it may not make sense. We're going to vote. No, no, go to executive yeah. session, but we're not going to go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so our first item on that agenda is to uh, approve the personnel report. May I get a motion? So moved. Wait, 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 second. Wait, 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 second. You, you've got those. You've got that down in your uh, in your action items right now. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, that's where. Uh, okay, I mean, I was just going to go right into. The, okay, I'm with you. I got you. So, Mr. Barnett, you take off. Okay. Uh, well, we've got to go back and thank vote. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. <laughs> point, point of order, point of order. We've got to vote to not go in executive session. you still got to take that original vote. Oh, okay. And so uh, you have a motion and a second. I had an amendment that passed. Now you've got to take the vote whether or not we're going to go. Okay. So uh, it, does anybody want to go to executive session? If you do, please raise your hand. <laughs> That's it. If you don't, then we are not going to executive session. All right. Are we good with that? We are voting not to go to executive session, Michelle, and that is a unanimous vote. Now you can pick up with your action. No. Okay. On to our action agenda. Yeah, that was impressive. Uh, <laughs> um, Thank God for the board attorney. Exactly. So as far as the action item uh, items uh, uh, this afternoon or morning, if it's still morning, um, so is the approval of the FY23-27 strategic plan that was presented uh, this morning. That's the, uh, the mission, vision, and beliefs, performance objectives, and strategy map. Hearing the superintendent's uh, recommendation to approve the fiscal year 23 through 27 strategic plan, may I get a motion? So moved. So moved by Mr. Fuller, second by? Second. By Mr. Clayton. Any discussion? All in favor? Raise your hand. It's a unanimous vote. Mr. Chairman, I also ask for approval of personnel items number one through 121 as presented to the board. Here in the so super, moved. <laughs> superintendent's recommendation for approval of personnel one through 121, first by Mr. Chester, second okay. by Mr. Clayton. Any discussion? All in favor? Next, Mr. Chairman's approval of the tribunal report is presented to the board items number one through 11. Here in the superintendent's recommendation for so approval moved. of the tribunal report. May I get a motion? So moved by Mr. Chester. Second. Second by Mr. Fuller. Any discussion? All in favor? I know you guys want to move fast, but we still have to do this the right way. Uh, go ahead. Mr. The final item, Mr. Chairman, is the field trip report. One item on there is presented to the board. Ask uh, approval of that. Hearing the superintendent's uh, recommendation to approve the field trip report, may I get a recommendation? So moved. So moved by Mr. Clayton. Second. Second by Ms. Collette. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. Mr. Chairman, so I have. Motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Mr. <laughs> Clayton. Second by Ms. Collette. We are uh, all in favor? All right. We're adjourned. Lord, y'all are killing.